anytime someone decides to do something extremely intense and physical and psychological in nature, you always got to ask like, what possesses, what has to possess a man to drive themselves to pulling a Jeep a hundred kilometers in one go. Like there's got to be a real strong fire behind that. What is that for you? You crazy man. Yes, it's interesting. I've done a lot of deep diving on. Come a bit closer to the mic. I've done a lot of deep diving on why, why I want to do things like this. Mm. Um, and I think it comes back to adrenaline. And I know that's probably not the coolest answer, or but that's the most truthful answer. Like I love the fear of not being able to complete something, mm. the fear of failure, because that is what invigorates me. Um, you know, my recipe for designing this event was pretty simple. I wanted something that I didn't know I could do. And being that I have quite an inflated ego, I thought I could do a lot. So I had to really put together something pretty crazy. And that's where this has come about. How did you come up with the idea to pull a Jeep? Why Jeep? Could have picked a plane. You could have picked any <laughs> asinine object to pull. Yeah. So, well, one, I own the Jeep. So that okay. makes it a little bit easier when it's your own car. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm not sure if you've seen, but there's a few people that have dragged a car a marathon. Mm. So Ross Edgley, for example, weapon of a guy, he's dragged the mar- uh, a mini, a 1.4 ton mini. Mm. Um, he did that in about 19 hours. Um, so I wanted to do something a little bit harder um, from just because I know that it's possible and I didn't, it wasn't about easy or hard. It was about if it's not possible or if it is possible. And the Jeep was, you know, scared the shit out of me to put it bluntly. Um, where a normal car didn't scare me as much. See, that's the thing. You talk about fear. I heard you talked about that. Like you're actually, you're scared and you admit that. Terrified. Terrified. Yeah. <laughs> terrified. Everyone everyone keeps asking me how I'm feeling for it. I'm terrified. How can you be prepared for something like this? There's only so far you can take your body <laughs> before it just, like, you don't know what, there's so many uncontrollables for an event like this. We've got, you know, muscular failure. And the furthest anyone's ever gone is 50 something Ks. 53 Ks, which was done about a month ago. And the guy... Oh, really? It took him 48 hours. So, hold on. What did he pull? He pulled a 1.5 ton car. So, lighter? Lighter. 500 kgs. 25% less light. Uh, 48 hours. It's 44 or something like that. 53 Ks. So... So, we're in trouble. (laughs) But I just think that people are a bit unprepared for it as well. Um, I've been... I feel like I've been preparing for something like this for a long time from a leg conditioning point of view, but we'll see. Hey. Well, your track record is one of spontaneous and planned extreme ultra events, mm. whether it's a Guinness World Record of burpees or whether it's just, well, let's just, just run a marathon or, or Ironman off no, no notice. Mm. You're used to this. Yeah. Look, I, I, there's one thing that I... I'm definitely not blessed with skill, that's for sure. I've always been the kid that was terrible at things um, from a coordination point of view, but I've always been the guy that just is happy to just eat crap for as long as it possibly takes. Mm. Um, So in my mind, although I know it's potentially impossible, if there's a way to get it done, I'm going to do everything I can. So then that gives me some sense of relief, knowing like, oh, well, at least I'm going to be stuck out there. I know that I'm going to give it my all and there's no way my mental is going to give up. What's more important to you, getting it done and pulling it 100 kilometers or, I don't know if you can compare it, or knowing that you died out there. You didn't finish it, but you died out there. Well, this is the thing, right? I'm terrified, but what gives me peace is knowing two things. Mm. That one, I'm going to finish it, or two, I'm going to do everything I can and hold my head high finishing it, not finishing it. And that's it. That's all you can control. Mm. They're the controllables that I have. Everything else is uncontrollable. Muscular failure, whatever it is, I've, mm. I've done what I think is best. I've put in 100%. The rest is just, is what it is. <laughs> so that gives me peace. How long do you, because if, if this guy who pulled 1.5 tons for 40 something hours, mm. how long is it going to take you to do this? What are you anticipating? So, double? Pardon? Double? Nah, nah, nah. I think that guy just, um, I don't know if he trained for that. Okay. So there's, there's some other reference points. So, two that I know about, um, roughly they were between 16 to 20 hours for a 1.5 ton. Yep. How long? Uh, Duration? Sorry, 42 Ks. Okay. 42 Ks. Okay. Yeah. So to do a marathon took, has taken people roughly an average between 16 to 22 hours. Okay. Right? So a day, a day of marathon. Cool. Um, 
so my my like my what I think is possible for me and what I'm actually estimating is 50 hours. Okay. Yeah. How are you thinking about because then the question becomes a couple factors, sleep, hydration, nutrition. Mm-hmm. How are you cuz when ultra marathon runners often when they do 100k's, 200k's, mm-hmm. they got a nap. They got to plan like micro sleeps. How are you planning your sleep number 1? So I'm not actually not because oh. look, I've done done a twenty four hour event. Oh, look, I'm definitely out of my depth in a lot of ways here. Yeah. And I'm going to find out. There's going to be a lot of things that I'm going to have to learn on the fly. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not denying that. But when it comes to, the, there's two things that I feel like I have that are in my arsenal, which is good. Which is I've got an iron gut. I can eat anything all the time, no matter what. If Even I'm, if you're training, doesn't oh, matter. Ah, oh, whatever. Beautiful. I can put it down. Awesome. Yeah. So, so that the metallic, nutrition you'll be. Yeah, I mean, I can eat. I could eat burgers while I run if I needed to and keep it down like That's it's never never been an issue for me so okay um sleep on the other hand I'm not sure um I would I was thinking an hour a little hour sleep through the night I don't know I think I just play it by ear a bit with this one if I'm if I'm in the zone and I feel like I'm going well great let's not take the sleep okay um, but I've never experienced anything more than 32 hours before so this is it this Go, is a first. with just in sleep deprivation yeah what were you doing 32 hours? That was the 24 hours of burpees. That was yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, I was pretty delirious and everything. So did you hallucinate when you did that? I did, about 15 hours in, what actually. Did, what was your hallucination like? I actually saw my dead grandfather. Whoa. It was pretty intense, yeah. I mean, it was just a concoction of emotion and no sleep. I think it wow. just, something was going on. Dude, that was 15 hours at the 15 hour that mark. 15, that was 15 hours. That was a hard 15 hours though. Yeah. This is a little bit more steady state, which is hard to imagine with the car, but... No, no, no. It's What's your average heart rate when, you, when you're when you out there? Do you measure it? 130 to 140. Okay. No, nothing. That's pretty manageable. Manageable. That's the thing about this is like there's a lot of things that make it possible mm. if you don't try and do it too quick. Right. Yeah. So that's that's the whole plan has been okay. manage load and stress over the 48 hours, not try and be a hero Yeah. and try and drag it as fast as you can. Because you said, I think, you don't care how long it takes you. Look, if I, I don't care how long it takes me because the, the endurance of it is so large, yeah. but I would be disappointed with under 50, 60 hours okay. if it goes over that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you got to be – another part is like let's say you sleep an hour or two. Well, now you wake up. How are you going to feel when you wake up? You, do you feel cognitively refreshed, but then how does your body feel? Do you start noticing all those aches and pains? So the burpees was a good example. I was thinking we were 15, 16 hours in. We said – Hey, let's have 30 minutes. Yeah. What was that like? Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Woke up terrible. So that's why I'm not putting in a sleep plan because okay. I, if I feel like cognitively I need to have a 20, 30 minute refresh, then I'll do it. But I know based off that experience, the body does not like it. I, I can't, I think it's, oh, it, it's a, an ultra endurance female athlete. I was listening to on Rogan and she talked about, you remember this one yeah, minute? She did like 300 Ks or something. It was ridiculous. She went blind. Is that the one? I th- yeah, yeah, I think I think so, yeah. yeah. And she only took like a one or two minute nap and she got so angry at people for, why'd you let me sleep so long? She thought she slept for like an hour. Yeah. You might just need to take like a... Well, that's it, right? And you know, you, there's a lot of science out there that says, you know, under 20 minutes is enough to just refresh the wiring mm-hmm. in your brain. Mm-hmm. So I'll run with that. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't be t- taking hours or anything like that. Because then your body temperature doesn't drop too low. Yeah. You know, you can hopefully recuperate, mm. st- stop hallucinating. The thing that I'm worried about is not, not so much the sleep as much as it is just... Muscular failure. Okay. Because you know, being that it is not, it's not a light, low impact event. Like you, your calves are under tension basically for two days. Okay. So there's a very big risk of rhabdo. There's a very big yep. risk of just something failing there. Which Rick, who you did the burpee 24 hours with, got. Mm, yeah. Right. Rhabdomyolysis. For those who don't know, what we're talking about um, protein literally leaks from the muscle into the bloodstream. Uh, you can be hospitalized and die. So for you, you're working with. Uh, Jamie from Melbourne Strength Culture. Are you guys, or is any, are you talking to anybody else about intra a nutrition, carbohydrate intake, and electrolytes? So I've spoken to a few people in the past, especially from the burpees, and I've um, essentially put together my own plan okay. with it. Because the heart rate is so manageable, the caloric i guess expenditure over the event is probably not as much as something like a run or whatever it is because when you run a lot of the time your body temperature's up massive you deplete 
carbohydrates pretty quickly. You deplete potassium and salt because of all the sweat. Mm. Where this, it's not as sweat driven. It's not as high heart rate. So the depletion is substantially low. So I, what I'm in, the, in short, what I'm trying to say is I've got a small calorie plan of what I plan to do. So I plan to be taking in anywhere between, you know, 300 to 800 calories an hour. Okay, cool. Um, you know, half salt tab every hour, whatever it is. Yep, yep. Um, but apart from that, I'm going to see how it go as well. Okay. Just be quite intuitive and listen. Yeah. Like. And because I can take calories in so well um, and I'm, I'm not running where I have to have a pit stop, like I've, I can just eat while I drag the car. Right. So if I feel Literally, because like, your arms are free. That's it. So I'd actually oh. don't have to stop. And the thing that is great about the car event is, is you can just lean in. <laughs> it sounds, makes it sound easy, but you can <laughs> lean into it and you can allow some of your body weight to move the car. Yeah. So it's, it's your mass that you need to break the inertia. And then once the car's going, you need calf, essentially calf power or calf endurance to be able to keep the car moving. Okay. So 300 to 800 calories per hour. You've got your salt tabs. Okay, pretty reasonable. Liquid, hydrate, like what about w- water, fluids? Are you planning that or is that just listen to your thirst? No, nah, no, that one's I'm probably a little bit more, I guess, strategic with. I need to be taking in a minimum of, you know, three three to 500 mils an hour minimum, Dude. which is not that much. But, but here's the thing. If you miss one or two hours, oh, you're, du- you're stuffed. You can yeah. severe, you can enter like severe, like hyponatremia, dehydration, mm. like you can set yourself up for failure. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing is you've got to, I've created, I've created Ziploc bags, right? So I've got a Ziploc bag every hour. Ah, Support nice. crew gives it to me. Yeah. And then I just eat what's in the Ziploc bag. Got it. Don't yeah, even think I, about if, it. Yeah. If I feel like something extra, I'll do it. But yeah. the minimum is the Ziploc bag. And inside there, there'll be either a sandwich, a gel, whatever it is. Mm. So there's always calories coming in. And there'll always be water recycled. They're always, we're always going to be eating, drinking. Awesome. We, are you going to have like, I don't know if it's, are you trying to have like on you, like a, a like a, what do you think? Camelback. Or Camelback, or yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll have one. Okay. What do you, the problem is with that is this like there's overdoing it too. O- over hydrating. Yeah. Right. Especially for an event because... Which sounds silly, but if you drink so much water in an event very quickly, you deplete your potassium and salt. Yeah. And then you run at risk of cramping. Yeah. Yeah, which is why you have the salt tablets. That's the whole purpose behind the salt tablets. Some runners and marathon runners end up taking it way too far. We can get edema in the brain. Mm. You get fluid retention and buildup if you don't have adequate salt and way too much water. Because mm. you just drink, drink, drink. Yeah, so that's that's the whole purpose behind the salt tabs, right? Yeah. But, yeah, should be interesting. It'll be more than interesting. <laughs> this will this this will send you to hell. Yeah, right. I'm excited to be there. But you like that? That's the kind of guy you are, like seeking that mm, adrenaline. Yeah, dopamine, adrenaline challenge, accomplishment. Yeah, you know. Um, I don't know. There's something peaceful about being in pain for me. Um, I think a lot of people would agree, and I think that's why the ultra community. Because, you know, I'm not an ultra racer. I don't like running, right? But in my own head, I'm an ultra person. Mm. That, that's what I am. Totally. Um, but though, all of those people that do ultras, they have this, once they've done it, they're just addicted to it. Because I think you find this sense of like, I don't know who you are when you're in the pits, when, you, when you're struggling so much or when you've hit this wall and then to be able to still complete something so much more after that mm. gives you this sense of achievement that you can't get from daily life. And so what happens, like, if, have you heard of Dr. Andrew Huberman? No, I haven't. Okay, he's a really uh, amazing neuroscientist that has been talking a lot about dopamine. And so what ends up happening is people seek further and further dopaminergenic activities, and it's almost like a little bit of a fix. It's like you need the next one, the next one, something to give you, I don't know if that describes you at all, but like constantly seeking more and more. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely my biggest curse and my biggest strength. Okay. Yeah, no, constantly gl- grass is greener. Next step, let's go. Let's so 100-kilometre Jeep now, what next? 500-kilometre, like, I don't know, crawl? See, I'm excited because I, if I do this, and in my m- mind I've already done it, but yeah. if I do this, I, I, this is this was for me the tester. Okay. Um, for I'm, what? Just for whatever I do next. Yeah. Like, it's, it's always going to be one up. I just want to, I, and then eventually I'm going to fail. Eventually I'm going to get messed up, but yeah. I'm, I want to find what that limit is first. And you hear people like, you know, James Lawrence, who did 100 triathlons in 100 days, right? And then you think you're back to the car thing, you're like, it's two days. Right. Yeah. So if you actually, if you take people like that that are absolutely 
nuts. And then you look at your event, you can kind of be like, oh, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, sure. But it's not that. Right. And then it's like, okay, I want to get, I want to see what that is. Yeah. I want to find that. Right. You know, Ross Edgley swam six months, Great Britain, like six hours on, six hours off for a hundred and something days or whatever it was. Like that shit's crazy. Like the ocean. Yeah. Have you? Oh, That's mate. where the sharks are. Bro. I know. That's exactly. I'm, I would rather do the car thing any day of the week <laughs> than swim in the ocean for six hours. Boy, that's when you're, that's when you're vulnerable. So do you think, how much of you think of this as genetics for you versus built? Like you built this mentality versus I was born like this. So I have grown up in an environment where parents are always fighting. Yeah. Very, I wouldn't say bad childhood, but I would say a childhood that had exposure to lots of stresses, which has allowed me to have some awesome qualities for events like this. It allows me to just be in my own head mm. and be out of my own head. So s- stuff can be going on wrong and I can just not care. I can just not listen. I can switch off emotion. So I have the ability of shutting off emotion very well. Is that good from a relationship point of view? No. But is it good in when it comes to exercise? Oh, yeah, it's phenomenal. So is it built? I would say so through conditioning of years and years and years mm. of things happening, I guess. I will get into it about if you want to share about kind of how you grew up, but it reminds me of people who grew up around violence, around abuse, uh, around addiction. You know, I have my own version of that where I, I, it's akin to being in the eye of the storm. So like I learned growing up that no matter all the chaos around me, focused, I'm calm. And so it's weird because there can be a big stresses in your environment that people are reacting to and you're almost like empty. Almost like, shouldn't I be feeling something? Like you feel very cold and like, whoa, this, you gotta be, this, is, this can be dangerous because then you can like disconnect from like people and relationships and the world mm. when you're just so hyper-focused. So I know that's, yeah. See, it's a, it's a dangerous quality yeah. because you can... Sometimes you can enter it on purpose and sometimes it, it'll just be switched on. So that's where I've really struggled throughout relationship settings is mm. because I can feel so empty in some ways. Yeah. But then I'd have to learn when it's okay to feel like that. Because right. in a car, like that's the perfect thing, isn't it? Like to feel nothing when you're just dra- walking. Yeah. You're in pain and just be like, no, nah, I don't want to feel that. Turn yeah. that off. Yeah. But when you want to show empathy, that's not the right time. No. Yeah. That's the time where what's the matter with you? Why, why don't you show any compassion or something, right? It's yeah. like, that's almost you got to learn. It is, yeah. And that's the thing about subconscious conditioning from your childhood. It's like some things are good and some things are bad. And you have to work out. And you don't know the difference a lot of the time. So you have to actually go in and take what you think is good and take what you think is bad and rebuild it. What was what was growing up in, in your home like, like when you were a kid? Describe it. <sighs> Look, I think it was, I always had a really supportive mum. Yeah who dated a lot of dickheads. Okay. And let's just put it that way, right? Like we had, you know, a lot of, there was a very abusive relationships that she had from a phys- physical, yes, but a very emotionally abusive. So they always used to fight every day, every day, every day. All Different the time. guys or just like one particular? There's two, there's two I'm thinking of, but it was, well, you know, we moved around a lot as when we were young. Like I moved 14 times before I was 14, 14 homes. Moved to Sydney, Melbourne, um, changing homes so like I've changed homes all the time I changed dads you know I've had this exposure of just constant I guess negativity so I use all of those experiences kind of has taught me to be resilient because you know at home I'm not attached to anything as my home I just see life as one big home mm. um you know seeing lots of arguments has allowed me to just kind of be like I don't want to deal with that so I can just turn that off mm. <laughs> so or you build up like a resistance to it yeah like armoring yeah like protection yeah, so it's all a journey. So, moved 14 times before you were 14. And then, do you, are you connected to your uh, maternal, your, your real father? No, I don't know my real dad. Did you, was, when did he come out of the picture? Did you ever know him? No. Five, I think it was four or five. When oh, I was wow. When I was. So, yeah. you, you, there's, is there any memory? I have no memory of that. And so, you know what? That's never, that's never really bothered me. Either. Yeah. Because you, things like that is like, nothing can hurt you if you don't know about it. Mm, mm, mm. Something like that's not bad. It's like ignorance. Yeah. It's like, no, it's like, no attachment. Yeah, I don't know my dad, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's all the, you know. It's the people you know that hurt you. They're the ones that are troubling. 
Right. You know what I mean? It's the people that are in your life that are close to you and then they're not close to you. That's the stuff that gets to you as a child, I think. What was that for you? Was that like through her pain, through your mother's pain, like other guys? Yeah, I think it's mum's such a beautiful person, but she always dated people that just, you know, weren't great for her. And, you know, you see your mum as your closest person or whatever it is at the time, especially my closest person, but she was always in pain Mm. mentally. So I became a little bit emotionally detached from that as well as a protective mechanism when I was young. Mm. So then that's just kind of like built into resilience and then resilience I've transferred over to business and work and I don't know, events. You, yeah, you put your energy, right? You put that energy into trying something productive, right? Yeah, exactly. It's that, resi- I think that's anyone that accomplishes anything comes from some type of resilient background yeah. or they at least find their own resilience. When, because you, you, there's a part of you that does these events for like the, I don't know if you would describe it as like masochist type of nature that you may have, like seeking pain and seeking for sure constant challenge. Absolutely. There's that part of you. But then there's the other part of you that, well, there's a cause behind this. Mm. Why did you, like the, is that the White Ribbon Foundation? Yeah, so that's domestic violence against women. So this is why I specifically chose that. Was I've done a few different events that have been, you know, charity mm. driven, mm. but I wanted something that's had some really big meaning to me in my life and my family. And we've always grown up with controlling men. Mm. That's just like the staple of our family, controlling dickhead men. Yeah. Um, and as a species, we we tend to be worse than women, and I'm especially from a control point of view. We so, can be very barbaric. Yes, yeah, definitely. So I just I just wanted to do something to raise. If I'm going to do something crazy for my own personal interest, yeah. then I want to marry it up with something that's going to make a lot of impact as well. So this okay. was the the perfect combination. If you're comfortable sharing, because I think uh, a lot of people. Mm have probably had a similar experience growing up to you, even other women like mm. your mother growing up in abusive households with abusive men and people. What was the, what was the earliest memory of witnessing or experiencing domestic violence and abuse? Do you remember? Yeah, of course. No, I don't think you forget things. Well, like sometimes that. you suppress shit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I, I think, God... It's, there's a few, there's a few pivotal moments. I think one of them was I was staying at a friend's house and mum came at 3am or something and I was like, well, what are you doing here, mum? Mm. And it turns out she got head butted and her face was all broken in by her partner at the time. So she had permanent nerve damage and all this stuff and we got flown from Sydney to Melbourne. That's probably the, one of the biggest violence issues. Um, but I guess, I guess the, the violence stuff is, is one thing. Or even emotional, right? But the emotional stuff's the worst. It's the constant exposure to arguments. It's the gaslighting. It's the, you know, making people feel crazy. Like, all of that stuff. That's what I saw mum go through. What was that like, witnessing that as a kid? Like, what did what were you going through? Like, how did that, how does that make a little, like, a child feel? To grow up in that environment really changes you. Yeah, it, well, it desensitizes you, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's good and bad. You should, like life's about connection. So when you see things like that, when you see things like people, you know, you see your mum with this person mm. and you see how she's treated, it desensitizes you to it because that's what a kid will do to survive mm. mentally is they'll desensitize, you know, so that they can not feel as much pain, right? But then that sticks with you. So I had to do a lot of rebuilding older in life to, I guess, what's the word? I don't know, to, to allow myself to feel more pain, to be more vulnerable. Mm. And that's like a big thing to do is to re- reconnect that and go, hey, like I need to be more vulnerable because like I've never really valued family or relationships because of those experiences. Mm. So like I don't spend any time with my family besides my mum. Is that something you want to work on or do you like, is that fine for you? No, of course it is. Something takes time. Because you're such a savage physically and mentally, mm. right? But then it's like, on the other side is like emotional strength and emotional mm. health, right? And I wonder if even talking about this can sometimes make people feel even more uncomfortable than the physical shit. For sure, this is uncomfortable as for me. Awesome. Yeah, no, nah, I hate talking about this. Do, do you, but I, I know that it's important because, especially from an awareness point of view, people yeah. need to know that 
you know, because I have people have this persona of me being this ruthless guy. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, you get that, right? Yeah, and I, I can see that. I can see that point, point of view. But reality is, is like, there's a lot of there's a lot of broken things in there as well. Yeah. There's a lot of past traumas. There's mm. a lot of pain. Mm. But everyone has that pain. I've just redirected mine into a physical achievement. Do you think that's the answer? I like, think, I think the answer is the exploration. Okay. I think the answer is exploration. Like, we get through traumas by doing talking about things, mm. by finding other things. Like, it just constantly looking to improve so i went on a big like i don't know what self-education journey maybe a few years ago i became obsessed with reading learning but what it did was it kind of like i was looking at all these things to get better at but it was also distraction from what i wasn't dealing with so then that's when i started like looking more internal about why i'm like how i am Mm. and then pulling things apart yeah it's it's kind of gone off topic but it's no but this is the topic mm. because this Partly made you. Mm. If you don't have those experiences and traumas, well, that's it. Tony Robbins says a good thing. He says if you're going to blame your past for the bad, you got to blame it for the good. Right. And I love that. It's good. It's fantastic, right? Oh shit. Yeah. So I still I look at that. Everything that I've maybe would see as a negative is actually what's made me in everything I am. That's a positive. Mm. So then you kind of just have this peace with it. It's like, oh, cool. Those things happen. Mm. You know. You acknowledge it for what it is, and it is what it is. What happened happened. What were you, what were you doing like to, for that self exploration, reflection? Like you di- you dove into a. Is there a particular book or person that really influenced you? I think being you know where I am now at work from a, a leader a leadership position. I think the most important quality that a leader can have is empathy and transparency. And I always tell people to you know follow follow those things but I think I needed to do a bit of it myself yeah so that's when I started looking a little bit more into my own personal situation and where I struggled with and empathy is something that I've always struggled with not because I don't care like I'm sympathetic I know when to say the right thing but I can't feel with that person the same way from a protective mechanism inside me so I was like I need to fix that shit how, how do you how do you fix that how do you address that well actually I just did a lot of a lot of effort a lot of studying into vulnerability a lot of studying into like Brene Brown's a fantastic person yeah, who she does. Came to mind too. Yeah, she read like I read Dare to Lead. That was a good book. Um, just all of those things. I think studying vulnerability and st- studying the areas that you know you're not good at, like even empathy, allows you to like realize where you're at fault or realize where you're not sufficient in. <laughs> so you can, and once you, once you're open with it, once you know it's a problem, the problem will slowly, slowly, slowly subside because you're aware of it. It's the shit you're not aware of that gets you into trouble. Right. The uh, unknown unknowns. Mm, exactly. Like the subconscious little habits and yeah, things you do and say. It's like, oh. Yeah, most people don't know they're an arrogant dick, but they are. Right? <laughs> is, yeah. is that something you've identified with? I just, know, um, I just know that sometimes I struggle with empathy, that's for sure. So there's yeah. something that when a situation arises where I know that empathy is an important quality, I have to really think, be, be in the situation. It's but funny you say think. Yeah. But really... Feel, yeah. Feel is probably a better word, but I have to think to feel right. sometimes because my natural subconscious is to not feel because that's my protective mechanism, See? right? There you go. So where if, now that it's open, it's like I think about it. Okay, okay, let's feel. Okay. Yeah. Is there something you tell yourself that would be valuable? Like, is there something you've learned to tell yourself in order to trigger you to feel that empathy? Yeah, I just remind myself what I would feel like in that situation. Okay. It's not like, you know, it's not like I don't have a heart. I can't, I understand when people are sad and I feel sad for them, but mm. it's the first instinct is to cut off emotionally. Mm. So if you told me something's wrong, I'd cut off emotionally if I cared about you because that's my subconscious. My subconscious wants to cut off. Just like you did when you were a kid with, with your mum. That's right. Mum was sad all the time. So I had to cut off from it. Mm. I did not feel it. Otherwise I'd be sad all the time. Right. So I built up resilience. I built mm. up a, a wall. Makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's totally, I think it's totally rational. It is, but it's like that with anything. You Unlogical. just insert any trauma. Yeah. You insert anything. Any, you know what? You don't even insert trauma. You insert any repetition. Any repetition into something creates a result. So you, rep, you the repetitive act of seeing something sad has created desensitivity to sadness. Right. Yeah? Just like the opposite. If you could see or saw someone always, always, always being, I don't know, 
happy. When they're sad, you might not have any resilience there. It might be just the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Mm. You might not be able to deal with it. Mm. So it's just anything that we see on repeat, anything that we feel on repeat, build something. This is why environment is so important. Like who you surround yeah. yourself with. Everything. Everything. Because if you're constantly around an environment that is, I don't know, a yes man in denial about the realities of what's going on and the pain and suffering that's going, you just ignore it, you push it aside, or you're around a bunch of optimistic winners who are constantly trying to self-reflect and grow and be ambitious and, and pursue things, just probably like you try and create that get going, mm. a bunch of leaders, like each one of those will predispose you to your like a, a potential future. Yeah, 100%. With your mum, you brought up, obviously, you've gotten a bit more, she's gotten a bit more public about sharing her own experiences, particularly with emotional abuse. But I wonder, growing up, what what did she teach you? Like, what are some of the main values and strongest qualities she has that mm. that you admire in her? So I think mum, I think you learn from your parents, in my case, parent, uh, you learn the things that you don't want and the things that you do want, right? So, like, you learn the things that she did good. You're like, oh, yeah, I'll have those. Mm -hmm. The things she did bad, you go, oh, I don't want to have those. So you do the opposite. So for mum, she was always the type of person that would tell me I can achieve anything, which is pretty ridiculous, really, if you think about that concept. It's not really that true. Um, but in my mind, that's what I got conditioned to thinking I could do anything and I had a mum that supported me whatever I would do. So I just did whatever the fuck I wanted to do. Mm. And I just pushed everything. So I learned from her to just dream big. That's probably the biggest thing. So I've always had really, really big dreams. But then I saw a life that I didn't want as well, financially especially. So I put everything into dreaming massive and then not wanting what she had. So I never wanted to live week to week. I never wanted to struggle for money, mm. you know. I didn't want to have to worry about having... 10 bucks like I can't even I used to I grew up not being able to receive presents because the idea of it made me feel sick so even to this day I still can't receive presents the idea of I'm gonna because I just feel so guilty because wow. mum gave me the world yeah but I knew she had nothing yeah so it's like I can't I can't accept shit did well one because she, she couldn't really afford to give you gifts well it's just well. like yeah I just like know how much she we needed the money yeah so then she would you know Give me something. I'm like, no, no, don't do that. Right. Why would you, you do that? There's, there's a, because there's a big cost and sacrifice you yeah. did to give me that. But, you know, you, you grow up and you learn that people do things for themselves too. Like giving is also a selfish thing in a way. To make they, them feel better. Yeah, they yeah. feel good. Yeah. So I need to learn to accept that. Have you heard of the love languages? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you've done that. I have not, but I know about them. I imagine gift giving is probably last for you. Absolutely. Right. I don't want that. I feel sick. I turned off my Facebook <laughs> on my birthday because I don't want anyone to, to post. Huh. Yeah, uh. I hate it. But that's not, that's uh, that's even words of affirmation. That's just recognition. I just don't, yeah, I don't like recognition. I don't like people telling me I've done well. I don't know what it is. That's oh. a new one though. I still got to do some exploring with that stuff. I don't know, uh, maybe it's somewhat as well. I don't want to ever feel like I've arrived to. Yeah. Like I like the constant chase. Yeah. Because saying, oh, you did this. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, I know, but I've got so much more to do. Right. It's the constant pursuit and process. Yeah. You never arrive. Nah, never arrive. But that's the game. That is. The that's game the is, that's the fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's the journey that makes things fun. The destination is just, you know. But there's two types of people. Like people ask me, I'm sure people have asked you, how do you stay motivated, Ethan? Mo this word motivated, right? Actually, I'm not even going to say anything. Like how do you respond when people ask you that? Because they think you must have this giant cave of <laughs> motivation you just pull from. Yeah. I don't want to train pretty much every day. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, That's it. I just have extremely good discipline to what I do. And I would do what I said I would do when I said I would do it, period. That's it. And the more you drill that, the more it is what it is. It's not like you just wake up one day and you just do the shit you said you would do. It's I've just been fighting against that forever. I've always been... I mean, I've, there's a few things I've always done. Like I've always been the type of person to work three jobs, trained really hard. I've always had that. But there's motivation, like... It doesn't even pop into my head. Mm. Yeah, I don't even like talking about that subject mm. because it's just, what, what, what is it? Yeah. Self, you know, if I want motivation, I might listen to a little TED talk or something and feel good for two minutes. Right. Um, but discipline and repetition is everything. It seems to me that the difference between some of the most successful, wealthy, fulfilled people is they're not, 
they're usually not outcome driven. They're not mm. driven by necessarily the, the end goal or the mountaintop, but they're driven by the constant climb. Mm. They get some type of reward and dopamine fix and fulfillment yeah. from that. 100%. Would completely agree. You think that's you? Yeah, I think that it started off achievement focused. Yeah. I think everyone does. Yeah. Um, I think anyone that's like, I just love the process. It's like, you didn't start off loving the yeah, process. Yeah, you, you could, you, could, you might get like that. Yeah, but then you you get to a point where you might have achieved something. So for me, I remember my big thing was like, a, um, I wanted to get the business to a certain point where I was like, for, at a certain financial level and it got there. And then I was like, oh, mm. fuck, that's what's happened now. Now what? <laughs> and then I had to, then the more, you did, more I did that, the more I realized that the reason I'm in this game is because I love what I do. Right. Yeah. And some days you don't love what you do, but you do it anyway. Right. But because yes. if you only turned up on the days you felt good... I'd be there once a week. Yeah. yeah. Same with training and... Yeah. Oh, just I'll do whenever. I mean, you can, right? Mm. But you can't have the expectations that you will progress or have any type of ambition expectations mm. if you're just turning up when you feel like it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a very like... It's, it's a bit of a seesaw act, isn't it? Because like you should enjoy what you want to do to a point, but there's a lot of times you don't enjoy it. I don't... <sighs> so like, it's a bit of a hard Personally, life. I don't really care about enjoyment. Fulfillment. Yeah, it's okay. Fulfillment. Right. Yeah. Fulfillment meaning? Fulfillment's what you want. Like if I want... No one, sorry, go. No, I just... You, you make a really good point though because I don't. I agree with you. Enjoyment is not what we should be chasing. It's fulfillment. Because training, like it's not that enjoyable, but it's fulfilling. Mm. And then you look at everything, like saving is not that enjoyable, but mm. it's fulfilling, mm. you know? So fulfillment is what we want, but we talk about happiness, enjoyment, like that's what it is, but mm. that's not what actually anyone should... Like doing drugs is fun. Yeah. You get a lot of big that, hit of dopamine. It's not, you know, it's not fulfilling. Mm. You know what I mean? So mm. it's like people confuse happiness with fulfillment. Mm -hmm. I think in society has sold people on this idea of happiness. Mm. It's like you got to 10 key steps to happiness. Yeah. Constant happiness. What is yeah. that? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd, happiness to me is doing what aligns with your values. Right. Okay. Aligns with your values. Because like, if you don't do something that aligns with your values, you don't you don't feel good about it, right? right. I feel like uh, also um, reading um, Johan Hari's book on uh, lost connections on like these major causes of modern causes of depression, and a lot of this is disconnections from certain things, disconnection from meaningful work, disconnection mm. from meaningful values, disconnection from um, meaningful relationships, and. One reason he pointed out and analyzed was that a lot of people feel depressed and unfulfilled in their jobs is because a lot of them lack autonomy and control in that. They lack control in their own uh, in their own work environment, the ability to have a say in certain decisions and contribute. And so that's it seems when I read that I'm like, huh. I wonder if that's also why so many people feel like depressed and low in their jobs because they're missing that purpose and fulfillment yeah, yeah. And, and and control because then you have you me you own your own shit you own a business it's like you get the say yeah maybe maybe you don't I mean, think so well i don't know i don't know if like i don't know if control for me personally like I like having the control over... Maybe that's a negative word, a negative yeah, connotation. I get what you mean, though. I get what you mean. For me, like... Because if I worked for someone and I was happy, I don't I don't know if that would bother me. It's just that I like... I like to be able to make the own set, my own say because I like to take risks. Yeah. That's Autonomy? Becomes, yeah. It's a hard one. Okay. It's a hard one. But you seem like you've, you've got, you're on that. Definitely. I definitely get what you mean. Okay. Sure. Yeah, and I love having control. I'm a control freak. I just mean maybe for everyone else, but <laughs> I'm a control freak. I want to have the say in everything. Does that mean, does that seep into your habits and routine as well, day to day? Yeah, everything. Like what yeah. is the... I'm relentless in my day. Like my, my routine on a daily basis is the same pretty much every day. What do you think, predis like what habits do you think are the, if you like habits of the most highly successful Ethan Fleming, like what is that for you? Yeah, I, well, I always set a massive goal. Always, I've always got a massive goal. I've got a massive list of just goals. So I wrote a, if this was a few years ago as well. So I wrote like a list of 100 things I wanted to do before I died. Mm. I wrote big business goals, wrote personal goals. I revisit them all the time. So I think goal setting is really important. Um, 
it's like the car thing that took me about 20 minutes to decide and then it's taken over nine months of my life but if I didn't have that 20 minutes of set, sitting down with myself and saying hey I want to search for a goal then the last nine months of my life I wouldn't have been doing this mm. so I think goal setting is so important and then the other side to that is the most successful thing you can do after that is forget about the goal and then be disciplined mm. how, what's discipline to you like how in the worst version of yourself, how did you pick yourself up to become disciplined? God, I wish it was like some fairy tale answer. I think it's just the same, doing the same shit over and over and over again until you get better at it, man. Like, but there's the first time, right? It was the first couple times when you just don't want to do it. Why'd you do it? For the car or just in general? No, no, no. In general, years ago. I don't know, man. I feel like, honestly, when it, I think I was 14 working three jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, like I came out of school working three jobs. I had built my own gardening business when I was like 16. We're dropping mailboxes into people's houses. You know, we we were earning thousands of dollars at 17 years old doing gardening. Like it was, I've, I feel like I just, because I was brought up in an environment that I didn't want to be poor, mm. I learned, I wanted to make money initially and I wanted to not be in my circumstances. So I've worked really, really hard early on. And then I just kind of stuck with that those like lessons that I learned early on in life. Like I've always been from the moment my feet touch the ground to the moment they I go to sleep. I've always been working a hundred percent. Sounds like it's just a byproduct of your environment. Yeah. I think that's, I think for me it's really out. environmental. Like I think that my environment and my upbringing has sculpted me to what I am. Like if you didn't have such a chaotic tumultuous upbringing. Yeah. I'd be a bum. Yeah. So is, I think about that because I'm like, you're going to grow up, maybe you're going to have kids one day. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, let's let's <laughs> say there's a version of you that does. Or well, there's yeah. some really successful people that do when they talk about how to get to their point, they went through a lot of suffering and pain. Mm. Like to build character and values to get to them to the point where they can work to um, really now have something, financial freedom, fulfillment, meaning, all of this. But now with all of this money, their kids grow up in an environment where it's it's nice. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah, nah. That's not that wouldn't be happening. I see like, for me, like I've had in this last, you know, two years, I feel like I've got the business to a point where I earn pretty good money for mm. what I do. Mm. I still live in the shittest box. I still eat the same thing. I still don't buy anything. I don't spend anything. Like I literally spend no money because I don't have any value in money for me. Like I don't it it brings me no joy. Money literally I mean not having enough money brings you unhappiness, but yeah. having an abundance of it doesn't bring you happiness. Well, you've hit Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like you've ticked all your boxes. Yeah, yeah. So for me, once I got to a certain point where I wasn't struggling and I was saving and I was earning good money mm. um, and to what some people consider pretty good money, I just, it's like, yeah, cool. That's it. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Some people, that's their game. Mm. Constant pursuit of more and more money, more things. more. yeah. You're playing a different game though. That's it. That's it, right. And you know what? That's for some people, that's their... Va- and then it comes down to values again, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. So for me, my value is like self-exploration, relentless progression, peak performance. This is stuff I've pre-written, by the way, that I knew. Because I did... The, I did A while ago, I did this um brand, like a personal brand Bible, mm. where I like ripped apart all of my core values. Mm. And I worked out like what my big three or four were. What are they? I just told you. Just Rel- saying again? So relentless progression, yeah. peak performance, and self-education. So this constant need to find my best and to be my best for me, not for accolades, just for me. And that in turn usually comes with an accolade because you're driving towards crazy shit. Yeah. But that's, that's for me, that's what brings me happiness. So anything that doesn't fit into that doesn't really bring me joy. Is there things that I'd maybe like to include one day into those little values? Sure, for sure, we'll get there one day. But right now, those are the things that I love. They're the things that I... So if it doesn't fit into that, I don't really enjoy it. Right. But this is the thing, you enjoy that process. You enjoy pursuing those values. That's it, yeah. Like, well, we look at what they are, relentless progression. So anything I do, I want to do at 100% intensity, all right? Self-education, I want to constantly learn to be better Mm -hmm. and then I can transfer that into any other skill Mm -hmm. and then peak performance just being the best at what I I do do. Where do you experience joy and happiness from because there's certain outlets people can have outside of the constant pursuit of voluntary suffering and work and those things like some people find a joy in watching a really good movie some people find joy in reading a book or going for a walk like what's your escape 
Do you have one from all of the chaos? Oh, escape is the wrong word because that is my escape because that's what I love to do. Okay. do. You know, when I go out and socialize with friends, that's that's not an escape. That's doing something that I don't want to do. Huh? You know what I mean? You like, kind of have to force yourself. Yeah, like I'm not extroverted at all. Yeah, yeah. Like I love being by myself, alone, yeah. my own thoughts. Yeah, it's good up there. Yeah, you know, but it's very familiar. Yeah, yeah. It's um. Do you have anything that I mean? Like yeah, you? of course. Like I have. I'm, I like. I watch a movie. Right. Um, you know, TV, watch TV and stuff. I can do that no, in my downtime, but that's people gonna people look at people like you. I don't know. Maybe people look at people like me, but not even use me. Like really exceptional people, Joker, Willink, the mm. Goggins, you, right? <laughs> and I know you're gonna laugh and put, put it in that conversation. Put me in the conversation. I know, I know, two, I know. You like fuck <laughs> off, right? And I get that because I'd feel the same. Um, but some people, you're that version to them, maybe at mm. least one person. And so they probably look, they, they might look at you and be like, man, all he does is work. All he does is hustle. Yeah, and they're probably not wrong either there, but it, the thing is, is it's not so much like a hustle, uh, like this hustle and grind, you know. <laughs> it's more so that it's just like I've just found what I love to do and I do it. Simple. It's whatever. You, if you knew what you love to do, you'd do it. The problem is, is you know where people <laughs> let themselves down is they don't bloody look for what they love to do. And because they don't love something, they're like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. But you have to search for that shit. Mm. I didn't just find what I wanted to do and then became relentless in it. Mm. You know, like I finished the car event. Like I spent like literally every day thinking about what I wanted to do next. And then I wrote down things. I built a whiteboard. I wrote a bunch of different ideas of what I wanted to do, how long I wanted to do it for. And I drew lines between them until I found it. So it's like mm. I didn't just stumble across it. You worked at it. I worked at finding it. Yeah. Yeah. I knew a foundational thing that I wanted to do something messed up and hard. And then I drew the lines. <laughs> Literally. I think that's the beautiful thing. Well, that that's the thing is that what do I do in this life? Mm. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm good at. Like I felt like that as a teenager. And at some point you just I, I, I try and think about chasing curiosities. Love it. Like what are you curious about? Yeah, I love what, it. What do you like do when, they, when you, no one's there? Yeah. If you could tell no one about, no one knew what you would do. Hundred, you'd probably pull that. a jeep or something. A hundred percent, man. A hundred percent. Like I don't even like it's not about a Guinness World Record or anything like that. It's you know, and I would be like, it's for me, it's about a personal endeavor. Yeah, yeah. It's not about accolades. Like I've had a lot of opportunities that have come my way, some beautiful things and some beautiful opportunities to pursue businesses or to have other things that would have probably brought me more financial success for sure. Mm. And I haven't even thought twice about it. I don't, wouldn't want to take it because I love what I do. And there is bliss in that. And I think that people should not ever, they should be, if they're not relentless towards a goal, they should be relentless towards finding one. Because it's that constant pursuit of finding a goal that makes us so happy. Or to, once we have the goal and we're, in, we're working towards it, if we're fulfilled by it, it's like a beautiful feeling that everyone should experience. But what, what gets a lot of people and what I see is that, Often I feel like a lot of the stuff I put out there and the education and like even the stuff you're doing, like a hundred percent, like there's a group of people that resonates with, mm. but then there's people who are depressed. They're maybe they're people like your mum used to be when she was raising you. They're in a really bad financial situation, low socioeconomic, depressed, down, maybe addicted to certain substances and alcohol or drugs, whatever. And thinking about even pursuing anything relentlessly is not even on their mind because they're just trying to put food on the table. And I, and I think about these people when I talk about nutrition or, oh, or training, I'm like, nah. this is not for them. And I feel like, damn, I need, a, I need yeah. to connect with these people. They just need to do the most basic of basic. But then I think about what do you tell those people? Completely different stuff because it's not relevant. No one, like it comes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If someone's struggling for food, they're not thinking about dragging a car and finding their next massive goal. Like I, you've got to solve the lowest hanging fruit first. Yeah, yeah. but maybe one of them mm. is, is listening to something like this. I mean, like what's the, what's the first thing someone like that could do? I think the rules are the same whether you're at the bottom, yeah. middle or the top, if you want to call it like that. It's the same thing. It's one percenters all the time. It's one percenters in the most valuable thing you can do. So one percenter for someone else might be saving 10 bucks a week. Right, right. right. One percenter could be training. You know what I mean? Like it's always the same thing. It's the same thing. It's goal, 
relentless progression, discipline, one percent is constant refresh. Next thing, yeah. So it's the same thing. Whether you're you just scale it back, you just scale it back. Got it. Yeah, it's the same process. It's the same principles. Like it's all, it's all the same. Like uh, maybe maybe you're morbidly obese and you go one kilo every two weeks, whatever. Yeah, that's your goal. You go for a walk down the street once, and that's fulfilling. That's awesome. Good on you. Pursue that shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people see things like what I'm trying to do, and then they compare. They compare, but like. You know, five years ago, I wasn't trying to do that. No, um, no, but it's good because people like you help remind, I don't know about other people feel, but remind me that, and I know I say this to people, not to compare yourself to who people are, but who you were yesterday. Mm. But at the same time, comparing can be a good gauge. 100%. And, and, mm. and in, full source of inspiration. Yeah, it's a good reminder that you can do more. Too. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. It's, yeah. it's just having a negative shame loop around that. That's the problem. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, so point. the first time I, I think what started me on this, the fitness journey side of things, like the crazy fitness journey, is I remember listening to one of Goggin's first video with Tom on Impact Theory years ago, maybe like 2017 or early 2018. Um, and he's like, I ran 100 miles, you know, in, off no training. And I was like, well, this guy can run 100 miles off no training. I can do a marathon off no training. So mm-hmm. then I did a marathon off no training and did it. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> what else is, you know, possible? And then people build this marathon to be like the pedestal of like, this is the most iconic thing you can do in endurance for the average person, right? Yeah. That's what I did. And then I just did it with no training. I was like, holy crap. Like that was, you know, that's comparison and it worked. And it's what started my journey. So that's what helped me set the car, the car thing, right? Because... Yeah, but like comparison to, yeah. to 100 triathlons in 100 days. It's like the car is easy. Yeah. Something's always comparable. Yeah, I swam in the, you swam in the ocean for yeah, so however long. Five months. Like dragging a car for two days when you've got friends there and support and you're on land and you can get food. I think that's, that's what's great about people like you. Like it helps me reflect. I'm like, man, I'm not doing enough. I got more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's a dangerous thought process too, right? Cause oh, I, of course I, it is. I get stuck in that too. I think it's like you've got to find that, uh, which I really struggle with this, so I'm not saying I'm the master in this, <laughs> but like you've got to find that line between like, oh, I can do so much more, but I'm also really happy with where I am, mm. you know? Because if you, if you, you, you can always compare and be miserable yeah, too. Yeah, like sure. someone's always going to be richer than you. Someone's yeah, always going to yeah, be fitter, stronger, do more than yeah. you, do it faster than you, whatever it is. Where, 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 when does it end? Maybe like yeah. Uh, so you can kill yourself. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. So like you've got to, you've got to like remind yourself of where you're at in, in your own journey and everyone's got their own personal journey. Like run your own race at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Compare. Yeah. Use it as a milestone, but don't be miserable with your life if you shouldn't be in a way. Yeah. I think what's great about people like you is, is you show what's possible. Like there's. Well, let's get it done first, but yeah. But even the things <laughs> you've done. Yeah. But even the fact that you dared to even do it mm. is is a source of like okay, he's br- he's overcoming his fear to do it, mm. or at least try. Yeah, well, that's right. I think I think that's um things that people struggle with the most is putting themselves out there to fail. And I, I was saying to someone the other day about the car event. It's like the more prep I do, the more I put it out there to the world, the bigger the fall is of the failure theoretically. Yeah. So, like, I'm having to speak to Avalon Airport and be like, yeah, I'm going to drag the car. And they're like, can you do it? I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course I can do it. People raising money. I'm like, yeah, of course I can do it. Of course. And in my mind, I think I can do it, but there's always control- uncontrollables. So, how did – explain this to me. So, we're going to talk about uncontrollables, but Avalon, the fact that you got Avalon Airport mm. is a game changer because what is that, a 3K runway? 6.6 total. Six? Yeah. So, three, three-ish up and then three – Ish back. The only concern with that is there's a slight incline on the way up. Ooh. You see, you just say that and you're like, oh, but no, <laughs> that's that no, can make a huge difference. That's everything. Yeah, it's everything. Have so. you been pulling on flat or in slight incline? There's slight inclines, there's flat. I mean, look, do you, do you want to know something crazy? With COVID, the, f- the travel limits and the curfew, man, I've only dragged a car a couple of times. Huh? But I've been simulating the car with sleds, with heavy tackle cages, anything I can drag with rope. So oh. I'm going to go from like 510K as my max car to 100, which is nuts. So the max you have pulled the car is how much now? 6, 7K. How, how was that? Pretty easy. But you'd hope so yeah. after everything I've been doing. Yeah. 
Yeah. If it's not, that's a problem. If that, that's a problem. So how long did that take you? Is it, did you try and go a bit faster then? Like, oh, it takes me roughly like 20, 22 minutes a K. Okay. Yes. You've done the math? I've done the math. What do you want to know? I know every mathematical <laughs> thing. <laughs> I want to know when you extrapolate, look, you won't be able to continue that rate, I assume, but let's say it's 22 to 30 minutes per K. What is that? 22 to th- uh, roughly between 37 and 47 hours. Somewhere. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you're in that two-day mark. Well, you know, if I do, yeah, the goal is I would love to get it under two days. That's like, you know, if I got, but I, at the same time, I just love to get it done as well. I know I'll get it done. I'm not, I'm, I mean, anything is done, anything is possible in the sense that if you break it down over a longer period of time, right? Yeah. Like if I could do 5K a day, sure. I could do 100 Yeah, that, that makes it much more um, accessible. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is, is like I'm, I'm doing it with the intention to do it under two days. Yeah. That's the intention. And I'll, I'm going to be relentless in the progression to do it under two days. So, okay, 3K up. How are you going to turn the car? Someone will drive. So th- you're going to... Someone Stop. will be sitting there in the car. The whole time? Yeah. Oh well, I've got a good, very, it's the thing is, these events are never individual events. Yeah, it's like it's, a team. It's a massive support team. I've got like 10 people helping me out. That's amazing. You know, beautiful people to yeah. come down, drive a car. You know, it's boring. And then someone's got to feed me. Someone's got to pace me. I mean, the pacing will be easy. I'm just walking. But still, like it's a, it's a, it's a big thing for people to do. Yeah. It's, yeah, it is, man. You, you've organized a team of people to support you. And then for what, right? Like to raise, to raise money, of course, but that's what it comes back to like personal endeavor, doesn't it? Because mm. like I've put, this thing has been more of a logistical nightmare than it has been a... What's been the hardest thing on that? Oh, I mean, like there's just so much to think about, like where it is, how we're going to do it, who's going to help, who's going to drive, who's going to do this, who's going to do this. I've, no, one, no one else is getting, no one's getting paid for this, right? Oh, no. Like everyone's just... It's goodwill. Have, yeah. So I have to help it shift people on, roster them on. Um, I've got to work out equipment, everything you can think of. Like I've got to even have a compressor to pump up the tires if they need to be pumped up. Like I've got to be able to change the tires if something goes wrong. If the car dies, how can I turn the car back on? Like you have a backup car? No, nah, I'm not. I'm, it's a Jeep or nothing. Like what if the what if the um what's like the f- auto park engages or something? <laughs> that or I thought of it. <laughs> the the attachment that you have. Oh, I've got yeah, I've got spare harnesses and stuff. All right, harness, cool. Even to the point of like having different pairs of shoes because your shoes are going to get so torn up. Yeah. Oh, what about temperature? Tempor- like, do you, you, you have any idea what temperature it's going to be that day? No. No idea. I mean, it's probably close enough. I could check maybe tomorrow or something. Yeah. That's eight days out. Because that che- rain, mm. like hail well, or yeah. top. Umbrellas. We've got umbrellas. It's like literally things like that. But you don't know yet how temperature. Okay. So someone's going to turn the car you won't be pulling the Jeep at the same time they're turning. They'll just... No, I'll be pulling You used to be still... Okay, there's just... constant slot. pressure. I mean, oh, there's okay. going to be... There'll have to be rest. I don't think it's humanly possible to just constantly... Have you planned in the rest? Like how frequently you're going to just... In my mind, it's six... It's one loop rest, one loop rest. How long do you want to rest for? Five minutes. What tops. are you doing in the rest? Just walk maybe and sit down for a bit. S- like Stretch, tissue work, nah. trigger... Like are you... Nah, you know, I don't love all that. Yeah. The reason I don't love that is your body's smart and knows what to do. Yeah, but you're pushing it to fucking help. Yeah, but it knows. It knows to stay <laughs> tight. It wants to stay tight. I feel like I don't want to loosen. I mean, look, we'll, okay. de- we'll deal with problems as they come up, yeah, right? Yeah. Like if, if there's something wrong, we'll deal with it. Yeah. We'll deal with Do it. Do you have like medical doctors, a physio on hand? Like, uh, I've got a physio on call. Call. Yeah. Look, I feel pretty, pre- I mean, I feel prepared. It may not sound like I'm prepared, but I've thought about pretty much every variable um, that I can possibly think of anyway. If you don't know what you don't know. But yeah. um, when it comes to like... I've, there's a few things that I am doing from a pre- precaution standpoint. All right? So I'm changing socks every hour because blisters, like if your, f- your feet are going to sweat, that resistance on the tip, like your, your socks. Are you, are you um, bandaging up your feet to give you some cushion? Not, not at the start, but I'm sure I'll get there. Yeah. I, I, I would be surprised if I have toes at the end of this. I, like I know that those are the first things that are going to go. Yeah. Um, the thing about pulling the car is, is like if you fight – fight it and you try and pull the car as hard as you can it can destroy you because it's two tons right like you can you can add as much resistance as you want or as little resistance as you want the goal is to apply the most the least amount of resistance to move the car or the least amount of force like put the least amount of effort in that's it to be as efficient as possible that's right because think about it if you wanted to sprint a two-ton car you could like you could max out you could completely max out and then be ruined so it's never easy it's Mm. never it's just about finding that enough tension so that you constantly moves. 
How, what's that pace then? What is that for you? About 22 minutes. Okay, okay. Yeah. that's what you figured yeah, out. So that's what I've tested. So I've, I've been walking sleds. That's been my training. How, how have your sleds been? At 40 to 80 kilos. But you can... It's harder. You, because the friction's different. It's harder. Yeah. The sled is harder than the car. That's funny. So the other day I did in the morning, uh, Sunday morning, I did an hour and a half on the car. Yeah. And then at night, an hour and a half on, the, on a 25 kg sled. It took me... I did 4.5K and 3K. So I did an extra K and a half with the car. In the same, same time. time. Yep. Yeah, in the same time. Because yeah. the sled, there's no momentum at all. Yeah, there's no it's wheels. dead weight. It's not rubber, it's metal. Yeah. Okay. What's the... Tr- Actually, no. Before I talk about training, I, I remember one of the things that stuck out to me in reading Goggin's audiobook or listening to Goggin's audiobook is how he would think about once he got really experienced, he's planned a lot better. His planning got really good where he mm. would... AARs at the end of your thing. Is oh, um, action reports? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Very good. Good memory. But he would like drive the mm. course mm. and he would think about setbacks, roadblocks, terrain changes. Mm. I know you just mentioned some, but what do you anticipate to be some of the biggest roadblocks and setbacks that could affect you? So the end, the feet are the contact points, okay. right? So look, I mean, I feel pretty good about a nutrition and hydration and yeah. food. I feel like I've, that's pretty organized and I'm well prepared for that given the type of event. Um, the feet, the contact points is probably the biggest issue because if they stop working, if my feet can't push force into the ground, I cannot move the car. It's that simple. So any, that's why I'm going over time with the socks. <laughs> Mm. You know, double I'm, socking. Like, what is it? Triple? It's just it's just Single? about moisture. Moisture is what causes blisters a lot of the time. Okay, so just fresh, dry socks. Got it. Changing shoes regularly. If my shoes start to burn out because it's going to be hot, there's going to be a lot of friction. So I wouldn't be surprised if I went through one or two pairs of shoes. So I'm bringing three pairs of shoes. What are you wearing? Um, honestly, I just like Asics. Yeah. They're good for me. Yeah, cool. Shout out. Should be a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, the Kanyo ones. Have you ever used those? They're they're insane. Heard of them? Are they black. Uh, they're black. Okay, yeah, I would have yeah. seen them. Yeah. yeah. You do um, marathons in those too, huh? Yeah, they're just comfortable. Yeah, they're cool. good. Look, I've, I've been training actually in barefoot. So Wait, what type of... Like literally barefoot oh, on the grass. You, the sled? Yeah. But it can't be the... No, no, no. Just the car tra- park. Yeah, yeah, just training. So you've been trying to strengthen your feet? Yeah, I've been hitting like barefoot shoes all the time. You um, like a Vivos? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been training a lot in just barefoot. Yeah, that's great. Um, just trying to turn my feet into bricks. Well, you, you think about, I don't know if you've seen photos of like, you know, hunter gatherer tribes that are still like mm. in, around the world and you look at their feet mm. and they splayed out and they they walk all the time, almost barefoot. Yeah. Well, I mean, Very strong. what was the, what was the guy that I'm ran the uh, uh, sub two hour marathon? Did barefoot? Well, no, he didn't barefoot. do it barefoot. He did it with those Nike shoes, the ones that propel you forward, but he trains barefoot. Oh. So there's a time and place for barefoot and there's a time and place for shoes. Yeah, but, but again... But training barefoot is always good, I think. And you have to work up to it. Yeah, yeah, for that, sure. You can get wrecked if you just start doing high loads. Yeah, if you go for a run barefoot, you're stuffed if you've never done it before. Yeah. Even yeah. a couple Ks can really humble you. Yeah, even Vivos. one. Yeah. I, I remember the first time I bought Vivos, I went for like a one or two K run and my yeah. calves were stuffed for a week. Whoa. Yeah. And then people start blaming these barefoot shoes and being like, they cause injuries. No, you just didn't manage volume and load properly. Yeah, 100%. Where well, everything comes back to doing something too fast or too not enough, right? It, Vivo's honestly changed my life. Those what have shoes. you noticed? Honestly, I used to have like uh, really bad foot cramps and pain. Mm. I don't have that anymore. I used to have really weak Achilles yeah. and calves. I yeah. feel like I don't have that anymore. Like I feel pretty bulletproof from knees down now. I would hope so from with the car event. Is there, what have some, been some injuries or just aches, pains that have been coming up over, I don't know how long you've been preparing for this, how long? Uh, about nine months. Yeah. Nine months? Yeah, eight, nine months. So over these nine months, mm. what has been some of the like holes in the bucket with your physical I did a body? disc, which is like, I've had, a, I've had disc issues for a long time. What, so I, slip disc? Yeah, L5. Okay, um, how'd you do that? Just deadlifting. Yeah, yeah that, but that put me out for a few days. Apart from that, I've actually touched wood. I've been pretty good. Nice. But it, it comes down to managing load, right? Yeah. And then when you have the injuries, small things come up. You can either ignore them and let them go bad or you can do something about them. Mm-hmm. I have got behind my knees, I can feel a bit of tendinopathy. Okay. Um, just Both of them? 
Yeah, yep. that's that. That probably I don't see that going away until over, after the event, just because the one thing to do is to not add load, right? But we're gonna have to add load. It's just <laughs> so, it's the nature of it. Yeah. So that's the decision I'm making. Okay. In the scheme of things, though, that's it. Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, if nice. it's actually surprisingly, it's um, it's a pretty amazing movement to do, because. I mean, we don't really train. I mean, sleds are so good for you, right? Yeah, pushing yeah. a prowler or pulling a prowler is like an awesome movement to do. Love it. But how often would we do that like three, four days a week? We wouldn't for extended periods of time. So I've basically been learning how to – I've been building up resistance in that area for nine months. How do you feel now? I feel like I could walk up a, a steep hill, like an alibi escalator or something. Like I feel like it, my calves – I feel like my calves are just bulletproof right now. That's awesome. Everything else has turned to spaghetti. But <laughs> like my – from – knees down it just feels like it there's i can tolerate anything but that's awesome because where are the most common injuries mm. knee ankle foot pretty yeah. much yeah so i mean i'm excited to Back. see what events after this i could do you know maybe like the fastest incline hill walk or something i don't know have you i can't remember if you have thousand steps kokoda not yeah. not the one in um i think it's Papua new guinea but the mm. one in yeah uh, yeah the one in danny or yeah. something in melbourne um i have done that a few times but i haven't done that I mean, I didn't start out just doing sleds and dragging things. I started out with, you know, a very specific weights program, started out with a lot of like leg volume. So even I was wearing a weighted vest and going on the stepper for two hours yeah. and things like that. Just conditioning In your general, legs. Yeah. Becoming more physically prepared for the movement. And then we added specificity, you know, throughout the and training. And as you got closer. Yeah. So how was, how long have you been working with Jamie and Strength Culture for? And this is um not I Smith, know, maybe Brizzy Otis. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe year and a half, two years or something. Okay, so that's a really good amount of time. Yeah. How has yeah, the sure. progression in periodization and training changed? Well, started, you know, three or four weight sessions, three or four cardio sessions, and then it's slowly gone from less weights to more of a specific movement, right, which we any program should. Um, so we've just added more and more things that are specific. So now it's pretty – my training is pretty boring now. Like I'm training weights twice a week, yep. always, no matter what. Full body? Full body, yep. twice a week. Never going to stop that. Yep. Um, that's the minimum I'll ever go with weights. Absolutely. Um, and then the rest of it is just dragging shit. That's it. So, and then how many, d- what's the frequency over the last three months that you've been dragging? I'm doing, so now I'm doing, this last few weeks, I've been doing th- three, three hours plus another hour and a half of just dragging sleds. So, what does three, three hours mean? Three, Different- three hour sessions of dragging something. A day. No, Not no, a day. God. No, no, no. A week. A week, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's manageable. Okay. I've been training it like, we've been training like a bit of an ultra program, you know? Okay. Same way you'd run a hundred Ks. Okay. So you have your long runs, your short runs. Yeah. So I have my long three hour sleds. I have my hour and a half sleds. Um, you know, jump on the assault bike for two hours. Everything's in two or three hours though. It's never less than that really. Okay. What do you do when, when you're in those, cause you have hours a day. So it's three times a week, two times a week you're doing weights, three times a week you're doing Three hours, yeah. Three hour bouts. And then a two hour sole bike and then another hour and a half sled. So I'm doing like 14, 15 hours of training a week. Okay. Oh, that's pretty much every day? Do you give yourself a day off? Uh, I give, try to give myself Sunday, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'll do one session twice a day. Okay. Oh, one day twice, is, you know what I mean. That's today. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> During those sessions, it's a lot of time, right? It's a lot of time to be in your own head. Yeah, sure. so... Where do you go? Are you just are you listen to music, listen to podcasts, audiobooks, just by yourself all the time? Um, it's different on different days. I mean, I, surprisingly, it's pretty. I don't find it that taxing anymore. I used to. I mean, because before the car thing, right? I was doing trying to do the burpee stuff, so I was doing hours of burpees, and I feel like hours of burpees <laughs> in comparison to hours of walking in a beautiful park, right? In the morning when yeah. the sun is rising and it's a little hot, it's pretty pretty easy. Yeah. Um, in comparison. But I mean, I, look, I, I'm not, I don't discriminate, right? I listen to Netflix. I watch Netflix Whatever. while I'm walking. Yeah, I'll cool, cool. Podcasts. Yep. I listen to enough audiobooks for a while, so I'm going to take a break for that. Anything to, and then sometimes it's just, I actually try to delay. One trick that I've learned that I think is really, really useful is if, don't just start listening to music or listening to something or trying to distract yourself. It's actually really nice to just, if you're feeling okay, like just listen to nothing and be, yep. be at peace with yep. nothingness. Mm. Because nothing, having nothing is fine too, but we tend to just like, oh, how can we distract ourselves? It's like, well, is it actually that bad? Do we need to be distracted right now? So I'm always fine. I can feel like I can find a meditative state. There's some sessions that I don't, I'm counting the minutes. 
there's some sessions where I swear to God I blink and it's done. Really? Three hours. You get in a done. really big zone. Just nothingness. Present. I'm present in the moment. It's like a deep meditation. It is. Yeah. And actually that's the perfect way I'd describe it. So I feel like I've blinked my eyes and my hour and a half's gone. I'm like, whoa. What's the difference between the sessions where that happens and the sessions where it doesn't happen? Frame of mind, for sure. What about it? Just going into it, accepting where I am and what I'm doing, and one's fighting against it. Uh, so, so when like, you fight against it, yes. every second is uh, takes forever. So I, I, people are like, oh, when you run, people, you know when you hear people run, they're always like, I'll break it down, and they'll do things like, oh, you know, it's 5K, it's only 1K five times. I hate that shit. I think that's the wrong way of approaching endurance. I think the way you should approach, en- approach endurance is not breaking it down. I think it's just like, being present it is what it is you're out here to suffer and that's what well you're out here to be here so just be here because mm. you know it's that it's that resistance fight that actually causes you it's tiring in your own brain yeah you know how much harder is a plank when you've only got five seconds left you know what i mean yeah but if you've got if you're just planking you're not thinking about it, you're just planking that's the only way that's the way i could guess i could describe it it's like if you go for a marathon and you say oh you know i've got you keep tracking the k's you're hitting Versus like, I'm just going to run for four and a half hours. I've, like for me, I don't know, maybe it's different for people, but for me, I find peace in just knowing I'm out there. So for the car thing, I'm not going to, I'm gonna, not going to focus too much on pace. Mm. I'm just going to be there, just get it done. Just not even think about it. Just, just walk, hang out with my friends. Do you, do you, <laughs> do you think, because I've, I've struggled with this, particularly when I was doing like a half marathon type of running distances, mm. it was a new experience for me. And I'm like, Man, I never run so much in my life. I know that's like pretty minimal to you, but it's like it can take up a lot of time. Obviously, you're doing it. So tiring. Yeah, I hate running. And at the, it can eat away at your day. Obviously, it's like you got shit to do. But obviously, that's part of the shit you said you'd do. Mm -hmm. But then on the other end, I got into that. I think a bit of a trap of like breaking it down and and like counting minutes and kilometers. Oh, kills you. Yeah, it it slows it down. Yeah, it's, it's. I that's I see. I try to break that negative. I don't. Some people. I don't think people realize that's a negative cycle. And I know that some for some people it isn't a negative cycle. Like some people break things down and they find enjoyment in it. It's cool. But I think for most people, it's a negative loop that we're stuck in. Like we're thinking about it ending. For me, I mm. feel like I'm grateful that I'm there. Okay, interesting. Yeah, like I really and like I think this is years of doing long p- bouts of exercise. I've like worked out the mindset that I need to be in. Um, for me, like when I'm training, it's just like, I, if I start thinking about how long it's like, I stop myself and I just reset and then I just think about nothing. Okay. Like, hold up. If you start thinking about like how long it's going to be. Oh yeah. You, stop. It's like, you, gotta, you physically stop. It's like, I've got to short circuit it. I've got to short circuit. I might stop doing that. Stop oh, you tell yourself stop, to yeah. stop thinking like that. Yeah. I'll be like, what are you doing? Stop. And then either there's two things. You're either in a meditative state or you're thinking about something else. So you get lost in your own thoughts. Okay. Do you know how easy it is to walk or run when you're thinking about something else? Right, 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 right. Yeah, and then you come back and you get out of your own head. That's why it's like it's e- they say it's easier to do events when you're not thinking about why you're doing anything about why something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like distracting yourself. On yeah, just I think just people underestimate how great distraction is. Mm. Like, I can sit on a bike and watch three, four episodes of something. And I'll be out there for three hours. And like, oh, this guy's ruthless. Like, I just watch Netflix for three hours, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm, you know, I walk a sled and like, what'd you do today? I'm like, I watched three episodes of something, <laughs> you know, I walk a sled and I probably watch more movies than you. And right. Every, you know, that's, that's, that's so funny. Movies. I've seen probably everything on Netflix. <laughs> I've watched everything. <laughs> and it's like, cause I'm out there, I'm doing, I'm doing something. I'm just like, people you don't need, you can distract yourself and it'd be fine. And it could be anything. It could be like a conversation with somebody. It could be on the phone. That's it. I'll call people sometimes when I'm doing the sled. Right. Like I'll look for anything, anything I can to distract myself. And then when I'm feeling good, I don't distract myself. Right, but here's the key. You're not reliant on distraction. Not reliant on distraction. Because if you were and then you were on, you're on the airport by yourself. Yeah. And you have no distraction. I'm comfortable in my own head, but I know that sometimes it's great to be out of my own head as well. Okay. So okay. like I take, sometimes I want to be distracted. Sometimes I want to be in my own head, but it is in a positive way. But if I'm feeling like I'm in a negative loop, like because it's sometimes you just feel more negative about exercising. That's just how it is. So those are good times to you know be distracted. Like sometimes I reply to emails when I'm walking the sled. Yeah, no, it's because you got your arms are free. Yeah, yeah. my arms are free. It's yeah. great. Yeah. That's why this event's been one of the most interesting things to train for. 
barely break a sweat and I just walk things. My calves are exhausted all the time, don't get me wrong, but I'm not maxing, I'm not, my heart rate's not going crazy. Like I'm literally doing like low steady state for hours every day. Right. While I'm on my phone. Right. It's almost like someone's pulling you <laughs> and you're just going for a walk every day. And Everyone else that's trained for this event has done it completely different. So it'll be interesting to see how we go. We train for this event. No one's trained for this. Well, no one's trained for this, but smaller versions of this. Everything that I've read has all been like weights training, like heavy, heavy weights training. Okay. And people were doing sleds, like big sessions of sleds and stuff. But no one's just broken it down to, I feel like, the most basic form, which is just drag something for hours. And do you know why? Because no one wants to drag something for hours. Right. They'd yeah. rather the shorter, quicker. We look for things that are in replacement of something. Because we don't want to do the something. Right. Yeah. I think that's one of the mistakes that I, if I could go back, there's a lot of things I'd go back and do differently, guiding you and Rick for the burpee challenge. Um, damn, a lot. But one of them would be spending a lot more time on the specific task. 100%. Like that's a mistake. Like I came in very like receptive to you guys and being like, I th- I th- these guys are confident to what they know will work best for them as well. Mm. I'm like, nah, man, I yeah, would have done a lot. Burpees. Yeah. Just don't overcomplicate it. We should have done... Fast and slow. Yep. Lots of them. And hours of them. Hours of them. And yep. I'm confident that you guys would have done a lot better that way. So I, I put my hand up and take responsibility for that. But you learn as well from that. I don't know. I was pretty happy with the result for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happened at the end of that? Um, that You broke one or two records? No. Nah, so this is what actually... I, I don't even know if we spoke about this. So what happened was is we so we did... 20, the, the record was 10,000 burpees. Burpees, sorry. These are not chest to floor, right? We did them not chest to floor, as the gu- guidelines uh, said to. I did 11,400. Rick got pulled halfway through from yep. Rabdo. Yep. Um, but we didn't get the Guinness World Record for it because I measured the lines wrong. Oh. Yeah, no. What? No joke. So attention to detail. So the distance of the lines from where you put your feet or hands? So something as simple as, you know, there's two lines, right? Where our feet had to go to the hand line. Yep. We, I thought it, when it said to the line, I was like to the line, not on the line. So it was just like the sample of... So imagine I did 11,400 burpees one centimetre shy of the Guinness World Record. But it's still my greatest achievement, personally. Yeah. Because, and no accolade. Because it's like I worked for something and in my mind I did what I wanted to do. Yeah. So that's why I think you've got to be really comfortable with that. It, I used to, it used to bother me. And I'm yeah. like, nah, that was awesome. You're at peace with that now? Yeah, I'm at peace with it. I think the accolade doesn't bother you I've got a Guinness World Record in burpees. I hate that one. That's Is that shit. the quick one? It's like the three-minute one. It's fucking pointless. <laughs> Cool, and it was like, Oh, you gotta give us a record. I'm like, I had that's what the one that I failed at is the one that I love, right? If it, I, like, I don't even think about that one, right? Because I'm not chasing the accolade, I'm chasing the journey. And you got and you, you surpassed it anyway, you got over 10,000, yeah, but look, that's not that important I, to you anyway. No, nah, look, I mean, it would have been nice, right? Whatever, but I got a video, the media says it was a world record, you can't take that away from <laughs> me. <laughs> In my mind, I was happy with it. Um, you know, this one, this car one, I'll do the it's I've it's no Guinness World Record exists. It doesn't exist. This. You're creating one. I've created it. But hold on, don't you have to get them there and have to make it all official? No, so I've applied for it and I paid. I mean, Guinness World Record. You pay. You have to pay, man. That's How much is this? I paid a thousand bucks to get it. Thousand? Credit. Yeah. Guinness? Yeah, and they set the rules for you. So I'm like, I was going to do a 1.4 ton car and they're like, you, got, you can do two ton. I was like, okay, no worries. You I'll can just, or you have to? You have to. So it's like- It's arbitrary. I know. It doesn't even exist. We're talking about have to. I know, it's a business. The people like forget. It's like it's not. It's not they like want it's a nice round number. It's not a not for profit. It's a fucking business. It's a, it's a business. Like they want it for profit. So thousand bucks paid it's it. It's cool, man. It's a business. I get it. Yeah, and I get that. I do get that. Um, you know, I love. I think I, like it, it carries weight doing it through Guinness. Cause I guess it's yeah. Regulated. You're paying for basically the accolade as well, the brand of it. For sure, for sure. And I, look, I'm doing it through Guinness this one. So I'm actually doing it through. So Guinness. they'll be there. No, like you have the way you, you have to record everything and abide by their details. So I've done it. I was going to do it the, 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 the event very different. Like I was going to do it um, over a, a shorter, a longer period of time and stuff. And they just decided, hey, no, you got to do it under sixty hours. I was like, all right, I'll do that. It doesn't exist, but you know what? No, yeah, exactly right. As Goggins would say, stay hard. So I just was like, okay, that is what it is. Yeah, might as well try. Is there any type of? Uh, I know you don't like rewards, but is there anything they, any type of monetary, no, there's no, no monetary get a certificate. Reward. Certificate. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. You probably won't put frame. that up anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll probably put that one up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you get a little certificate. All right, cool. Chuck it in your Instagram bio or something. That's about, <laughs> that's about as far as it goes from an accolade point of view. Uh, how does it work? Is Avalon Airport, a, it's a functioning airport right now. 
Um, is there so planes coming in now? Emergency planes, but no domestic or so international. So, so they actually resume flights on the 5th of October. So When are you pulling uh, this thing? 5th of November, sorry. Um, oh, 27th of October. 27th of October. Yeah. Are there, there going to be any... Wow, that's great timing. Perfect timing. When else could you pull a Jeep on, a, on a pal- an airport? Was, that was lucky. I put a lot of emails and a lot of calls out there and they were lovely to let me do it. Did, did How did you organise that? Did it take a... Did they, were they pretty receptive? Did you have to really get on them? No, they were fine. They were fantastic. I mean, I've emailed a lot of places. Like I emailed every airport, every runway, every race course, every athletics track. Um, and they were actually one of the last emails I sent. I, just, oh. I actually looked at their on, on Google Maps. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to work. It's just one straight. And then I didn't realise there was like a little curved bit. Um, so I just used Google Maps and then ruled them out. So will there be any planes coming through there that you know of? There's potentially emergency planes. So, so you don't know? No. So if that happens, they have to put me on a little car. The car has to be moved. So we have to chalk the ground of where it is. They have to move <gasps> me off and then we have to go back and reset. So there's a very, very real possibility that I could be moved a few times. Wow. Mm. That, but that could change the tempo and timing of this. Yeah. Every, there's a lot of, it's a lot of uncontrollable. That would be interesting. Yeah. Bloody hell. Is there anything else you're looking out for that could be an unforeseen complication? Um, prob- if I'm honest, probably the biggest thing I am worried about is there reco- there's a certain amount of force that is required to move a car for it to be in, I guess, a momentum. You know, it has to be in momentum, right? If you can't generate that force, you can't move the car. It's that yes. simple. Yes. So you can still be pushing, but if you can't, Get it to that point. So there's, I'm worried that one at a certain point I will not be able to generate that force. Have you calculated the amount of newtons of force you need versus body? Like, is that even interesting to you? Nah, I mean, look, it depends. If I go up a hill, I have a slight, the slightest incline, I have to generate a lot of force, right? So if I'm going straight or down, I can walk it with a bit of force. So... I'm worried at a certain point that muscular failure will be a real thing and I just can't generate the force. But I think at the same time, you can use a lot of your body weight. and Leverage it, yeah. But we know muscular failure can occur for a number of reasons. It can be a nervous system issue. It can be an electrolyte issue. Mm. Have you looked into that to like... Yeah, I mean, you can do everything you can. You can train for something. You can be prepared. You can hydrate. You can have fuel. You can sleep. At the end of the day, the rest is, is what it is. Right. It's like your body may or may not respond at some point. At some point, it's possible. I mean, most of the time, it's probably your mind first. Right. But the, there is a, you know, that is a real f- possibility too. Only one way to find out, right? That's it, 100%. Your, what does your recovery look like now? Your recovery, your, like, sleep, I tell my clients and just, like, people who, like, are really, you know, colleagues and clients is, like, Sleep is really the foundation. It turns that's all the everything. other cogs. Yeah, every, that's everything. People get so carried away with all the other stuff. I and think that's the main one. Yeah, sleep and drink water. Yeah, hydrate. Yeah, yeah. Religiously. Yep, and then nutrition. Yep. How has that been over the last, you know, six to nine months? How have you been thinking about that? Well, I mean, the first few months was the, am I going to do this? Mm-hmm. Training for it and seeing it possible in my own mind. Um, after that, it was the, the recovery just became... I don't know. I feel like I've always had good sleep. Mm. Like I, I sleep perfectly every night. You don't wake up in the middle of the night? No. That's great. I, sleep, I mean, there's every now and then, every like month or so, there's a bad day. But Damn. 99% of the time, I hit the pillow, I fall asleep. That's awesome. Yeah. How long? Do you record it? Seven hours, seven-ish hours. I'm not, I don't sleep for the longest, um, but I'm between seven and eight hours, six, maybe six to eight hours. Um, Are you trying to push it more now? Uh, yeah. Not really, no. More so because I value – I'm still – like, it's not like I don't work, you know, of yeah, and I, but by the time I've worked, like, you know, I'm dragging the sled for three hours and then going straight to work and I don't finish, I get there at, you know, 7, 8 a.m. and then I'm working there till 5, 6 p.m. and then by the time I've cooked my food, it's 8, 9 o'clock, you know, so. You do not have a girlfriend, do you? No, no. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's not, <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of time, really. Because so. she would dump your ass tomorrow. Yeah. Or, or support you, and maybe you'd probably marry her. <laughs> no, yeah, no, we tried that. Um, <laughs> no, so it's, yeah. I get a lot of sleep. Okay. For me, for me. I'm, okay. happy, I'm happy with no, that. No, if you, like, energy, f- fatigue isn't a problem. Like, you're performing the way you... I haven't missed a day since it started, nine months. And to the point that uh-huh. even two minutes, if I cut the session short two minutes on the sled, I'll go re- do that the next day. Right, to make up for it. Yeah. Okay. Like I have not missed a session. 
and we were talking um, off camera, just so people are aware, your calories are upwards of, well, how much do you weigh right now? What, what are your calories? So I started at 81.5 and I'm sitting at about 90 now. So this so, was started so nine months a, ago, yeah, 81. Yeah, I've been doing about a kilo a month. So about 250 grams a week. Nice. That's, yep. I would have liked it to be more, if I'm honest. I would have liked, I mean, even fat. I would have taken anything. Well, if it was faster, it'd be more fat, naturally. Um, but the, the thing is, is that I have just been training so much yeah. that I, to get the calories in is, is actually harder than the actual training. <laughs> like this morning, like I'm having, it, I have, and I also don't like eating crap. Yeah. That's for me, it's like a... Is it a psychological thing too? Or does it make you actually feel like shit? I don't know. I just don't, if it's not good for me, I don't really like it. Uh-huh. If it's preservatives and full of sh- sugar and stuff, I just, like, I don't love it. Mm. So, I mean, I've had to, like, I've been taking, you know, multidextrin and things like that and mm. while I train. And but the practicality of it is that at a certain caloric surplus, like, ugh, it just becomes really, really difficult to mm. get it in through whole, nutrient-dense, clean foods. 100%. I mean, today I had Cocoa Pops. Right. And amongst millions of other things, but like I'm having to dirty things up yeah. because I'm physically not making it in time. This is the nature of things. Yeah. Road con for bodybuilders, strong man to like yeah. do this. Yeah, for sure. You're in this territory. Yeah. Endurance racer slash strong man at this point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the title of it is really smart. Like the world's strongest um, ultra. ultra. Yeah, I'm not going to take credit for that. Ross Edgley called his the world's strongest marathon. So uh, straight, huh. straight copy. No, it's <laughs> but works for you. Yeah. So 100 kilometers is an ultra. You're pulling it with a Jeep. What's the next, how many days? Eight. How do you feel now? And what do the next eight days look like? Um, just slightly less training. So you're like tapering off? That's it, yeah, just drop of 20, 30 minutes off each session. I'm still doing pretty high volumes, to be honest. Yeah. Because it's, it's low impact. So, and I don't really want to stop training right now either. I feel good. Everything feels good. You know, so I would tailor it back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, if I wasn't feeling good at this point, there'd be an issue. Like, I don't want to, I didn't want to be coming into this event tired, stressed, you know. It's not like a bodybuilding comp where you have to be a certain body fat and you have oh. to be miserable. Like, I need to feel good. Yeah. I want to walk into this feeling psych- psychologically sound, yep. physically sound, yep. you know, which I am. Mm. So. And the days before, is there any type of different plan or regime that you're thinking of? So. About six weeks out from it, pretty much anything, I pretty much don't give in to any instant gratification a few weeks out. Why? Because it's, if I give it in then, I'll give it in on the car. Right. So like cold showers, everything. Yep. I wouldn't do that. I don't do that. I do love a good cold shower and I do try and do that regularly, but it's not even about any bullshit effects. It's yeah. just about doing the hard thing. Right. And so like, I want to drill that in as a bit of a habit. Right. It's almost yeah. like your, um, what should I say? It's like you're getting ready for a fight or a war. It is. It's like the last six weeks is like fight camp. Okay. That's so, right. Yeah. I've got to do everything I want to do. So what are those habits? Cut. Cold showers. What else? Cold showers. Wake up when I said I wake up. Like it's just very ruthless. Yep. Like I just do not do anything that is not what I should be doing. Mm. <laughs> and I just wouldn't, even if it's small, like I have to do it perfect, perfectly, perfectly. Mm. Um, otherwise it just gets into my head. Like quitting is a habit. Mm. You know? So I want to, be resilient up here, you know? So then when I do it, it's just, it's what it is. It's like it's so natural and normal to you. Yeah, because theoretically speaking, it's physically I should be there. So based off the training, right? it's possible. That's what I've been training for. So mentally it's the thing that's going to let me down. What do you think is stronger? Can you even compare it mentally or physically? I don't know. I feel like I'm just never the type of person to s- stop something. I'm too stubborn. Do you think one day you'll do one of the events and you could die or nearly die? Do you think about that? never thought about it no but it's i'm sure it's possible now's the time <laughs> yeah yeah nah i mean if you're prepared enough you shouldn't be thinking about that really i mean worst case scenario you get you know like late night middle of the night thoughts you know like hmm oh, i wonder be- how far i can push this uh meat machine of mine yeah <laughs> yeah maybe i mean there's 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 a point where i'm sure the pendulum will swing the other way and something will go wrong but i mean to, it's not like i forget i'm probably more likely to get hit by a car yeah. We're more likely to get run over by the car. Or, or if you're running like through, um, you're doing some type of ultra event in the middle of nature. You, yeah. you stumble upon a who knows what. Adventure adventure stuff for sure. That's yeah. more likely. Yeah. yeah. Out in the wilderness. Is Do you actually, you know that goal list you said? Mm. 
I know pe- sometimes I know I wouldn't probably say much about mine, um, but if you want to share, like, what's one of the ones on this goal list you have that gives you the most, that scares you the most? Mm, I had stand up comedy on there. <laughs> that's that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I love that because it's, like, <laughs> it's complete opposite. It is, but, but that's for why. your nature. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I like to think I'm pretty funny, but. <laughs> There's, there's, there's one thing being funny to yourself and then being funny to an audience. But yes, yeah, right. yeah, literally, I had stand up comedy on there. So that's probably the one that terrifies me the most. Yeah, it terrifies a lot of people, man. <laughs> it would be horrible. I think um, speaking in front of a crowd is supposed to be like one of the major phobias of people. Well, I love, years. actually, so I love public speaking, which is quite odd considering I'm saying I'm introvert. I, I, can, I can speak to groups of 100 people easy. Like I find that exhilarating. But the, the but comedy the, the funny, is different. I, yeah, I think that's probably just the one on there that's like the – the most 360 from anything else. Like most of the other stuff on there is like physical challenges, mental challenges, financial challenges. And this is just like do a comedy festival. Is that something you're planning to do soon? Jeez, oh, I don't know. I haven't time. I've got to just focus on the car for now. But is, there, <laughs> is there anything else physical or psychological that really scares you on that list? Something bigger than the Jeep? Not that's on the list. No. What I'm, about? Well, I mean, look, I, I've probably the, I've got not a, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, Probably all this stuff is my comfort zone, man. Like the Jeep phys- is still physical is my comfort zone. Yeah, mental is my comfort zone. That's not like that. That's Until it's not. Yeah, to I'm, a point though. Well, like no one's comfortable dragging a Jeep, but what I, I guess the foundation of what it is is what I'm comfortable with. Like I'm comfortable with striving towards a crazy physical challenge that I could not do. That that's comfortable for me. So yeah, it's not not going to be comfortable during it for sure, but putting it on the goal list and working towards it's not uncomfortable for me. What scares you then? What gives you fear? Well, I'm terrified of relationships. I'm terrified of all that side of things. Okay. So. Like a yeah. commitment and vulnerability? Yeah. Yeah. I don't love that. Okay. So that's probably my my personal weaknesses. All right. That's where I'd let myself down on the, the dinner plate theory, you know? <laughs> the dinner plate <laughs> theory. Um, is there anything else like heights, um, swimming, animals, no, nah, I love all those. I love I love that type of stuff. Like I really do. Like adrenaline stuff. I love adrenaline. Have man. you seen David Blaine? No. What I he haven't. did um with, you know, up the movie with the balloons. Um Oh yeah, he did that. He, he did that. Oh god. He was harnessed to these balloons and he he parachuted down. Yeah, crazy. I mean, don't get me wrong, that stuff's scary. I'm not saying it's not scary. I'm yeah. saying it's something that I'd want to do, it's something that would like I would be, lo- I would love the opportunity to go jump off a cliff in like a, you know, base jumping. Or something. Yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, okay. That'd be terrifying. I'm yeah. not saying I'm not scared. Okay. I'm saying I want to do but it. But it also excites you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's like a fear. I think f- like fear is exciting, but it can also be negative. And what I'm saying is those fears to me are positive fears. Right. Yeah. Um, it's like you stress and de-stress. You stress mm. is like a positive stress, for example. 100%. That's perfect. <sighs> What's next? I don't like to say what's next, but I'm I'm just too curious to not ask. Like I know you and I know Mm -hmm. there will usually always be a what's next until you're physically incapable, right? What do you think comes after this? I don't know, something scary. (laughs) Something very scary. Very scary. That's exciting. Yeah, I I think something – I want to have some time to repair some of the damage I've done to my body over like some stupid things. Like, yeah. you know, I did a triathlon of no notice a while ago. What was that like? like? Um, well, I mean, like, if I, w- I it was horrible, actually. It was pretty hard, but I did it. That's actually, that was my, after the burpee thing, that's what I, that was my next kind of thing. I was like. How long did you wait before you did that? Oh, I was training four burpees at the time. This is a bit of a weird story. I'll try and summarize it real quick, but I was training for burpee, a 60 minute world record. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I spoke to that SAS show. Um, mm. I spoke to them and they want, potentially wanted to put me on it. And I had an inter- my final interview with them. And they like, wanted me to talk about my physical challenges. And I was like, I don't have enough. So I was like, I need one more. They said that or you felt that? I felt that. Right. Yeah, I wanted to add something to my resume. So off 48 hours notice, I was like, I'm going to do a full distance triathlon with no notice and just on my own support. So I did it. So I drove to the pool in the morning. Oh, this this wasn't a this no, you made no, no, it. No, this wasn't an event, man. This was like DIY type <laughs> shit. 
I just drove, out there in the ocean. Oh no, pool. I pool. drove to the pool. Yeah, okay. the pool was the soft part. But I drove to the pool. I had the bike in the back of the car. I drove to the pool. I hit the 3.9k. I got out, drive myself off. Had a gel that I had in the car. <laughs> I jumped on my bike. I went and hit the 180k's. Riding. Where around. did you go? Man, I rode so many loops around St Kilda and Port Melbourne and Frank. Oh, you didn't. Eat, oh my god. I didn't even like. I was in. I, I reckon I hit like a thousand traffic lights. Like it was because like normally I didn't even consider that. So it took me hours. You could have hours. I mean, you could have gone all the way to. I know. She who knows? To like Geelong. Morning. Yeah. No. So I did that, and then I got back and um, dropped the bike off. At, like I finished at home, yeah. And then I ran from my house to a, f- a massive loop, and then back to a friend's to finish. How long is the run? A marathon. Oh, of yes. course. So four k, four k swim, one hundred eighty k bike bike ride, and then a forty two k run off no notice, zero. What What is that like? Like. What are the, the high and low points in that? No low points until 20K into the run. Oh. Yeah. Well, that far. Yeah, I feel like the bike was boring. But it wasn't, I didn't find, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I'm, like I enjoy, I enjoy long bouts of exercise. So, yeah. so for me, that's. You don't say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I can't, now hearing myself talk, I'm like, this, this guy's a bit crazy actually. Um, but you have to be, I think you have to be a little psychotic to do yeah. this shit. Yeah, I think that we also, things are harder in, like, you know, there's a good quote from the Stoics, like, things are harder in imagination than they are in reality. Yeah, and we suffer in imagination yeah. a lot. Yeah, so, like, I was like, how, what, I'm getting to ride my bike around Melbourne, the weather's beautiful. Like, I'm not... You find... I find peace in it. I, I, that's interesting about you. find ways to be grateful? Yeah. I try to remind... I try to be grateful. Like, when I'm getting the opportunity to drag a car. Right, you don't awesome. have to, you get yeah, to. I get to. That's awesome. I get to go train in the morning. Like, I, I love that. So you just reframe it. So you, that, then that's what, that, that's it, man. Cause I'm trying, I'm trying to like, almost like study your own psychology. I'm like, huh, what makes him so unique in that way? Because people are outcome driven, right? But he's not outcome driven, really. He, like, how do you get in a zone? Well, you kind of have this self talk reframe where you try and snap yourself out of any time you're, um, what is it? Anytime you're trying to like count minutes or anything. Mm. And then to what, just deploying gratitude for the moment? Like I am where I need to be in this moment. Like how, how are you staying in that? Do you know what? I think it's uh, it's less complicated in the sense that I'm just not thinking huh. in a way. You know what I'm going to ask you, right? Yeah. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, man. When you're tired, all you think about is food and water. Yeah. You don't think about anything else. So just go with it. <laughs> So I'm trying to think about it. So I'm trying to overthink it. Just like even now? I'm just as in like when you're training for long periods of time. Most of the time you're just thinking about like food and water. Mm. If you, if you, and I just have got better at not thinking about the other stuff. How do you not think? Practice. How do you meditate and not think? Okay. Right? Meditation's a practice too. Right? When you first start meditating, you're like, oh my, all these things coming into your head. You can't, and then eventually you get into better periods of it. Like where you can go for longer and meditate longer. Like a muscle. Yeah. So I can't, like I've never, I don't meditate. Um, Not but formally, but no, but really. That's, that's right. That's my do. informal meditation. Yeah. Like that's, so like I can, I can actually be brain dead for three hours dri- riding a bike and not think, which is probably dangerous on the bike, but I can, I can exercise for hours and not think. Do you start like that? Or how do you work into that? I didn't start like this. It's just, just practice. No, no, no. I mean, the actual bout of like you pull in Jeep for three hours. All right, here we go. We're, we're on. Do you, are you kind of immediately in that zone or is it like you have to talk yourself into it? Um, there are certain rituals or habits that you do? There, to- are, there are actually some good little things that I would do. Like cert- certain things I would... Um, I mean, one thing that I have definitely started doing more recently is no music, no, no external stim stimuli from anything or whatever it is like i just like i'll start off my walk with like being really really grounded um so kind of like it's a, it's a bit, actually like a bit of a monk practice where you like go walk around and you like pick things out and you, th- you like see them and you take note of them so i kind of do that when i train so i like to just train and like see things and be like, oh that's cool oh you'll observe your yeah, environment like and just take note of them yeah I'll just be like really present in the environment but you gotta remember this stuff is really steady state stuff like this this is like you can't do this stuff doing max one rm like one rms right or you know doing a crazy intense workout like you, you're not thinking like just enjoy it like right no, no. That, no yeah. this is steady state I got you got you got you yeah if i'm doing some hard shit i'm digging deep and some dark stuff right but 
for the steady state, there's n- it's not even painful. It's just boring. So you but act- that's a suffering in of itself. Yeah. So that's where it's all like, but you can be bored anytime you choose not to be bored. Anytime you choose not to be bored. You can be not bored, sorry. Or like you can remove boredom from your brain if you wanted to. Because there's always ways of amusing yourself. Of course. Distraction. And, but you try and avoid that, particularly in the beginning anyway. Yeah, because that's a practice. It's the practice of being the more present I am in the moment, the less I need distraction. So sometimes I'll distract myself and sometimes I'll practice not being distracted. (laughs) Now I'm confused, but... No, no, no. It's like you're building this muscle Mm. of presentness. You're not being totally reliant on listening to music all the time or podcasts. You're not being totally reliant on just having nothing. I guarantee when I'm doing this car event, Mm. I'm... There'll be periods where I'm watching TV. Just like on your phone? On my phone. I'll be walking there, leaning over on Netflix. Yep. There'll be periods where I'm talking to friends and there'll be periods with the headphones on, yep. listening to music, and then there'll be periods where I'll just be silent. How do you pick? Just or is it just I very think? auto-regulate? How yeah. You okay. Well, some things are boring. I don't want to do them, so I'll do something else. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Okay. Yes. But I do like that. M- music is like, you know, it, it does you know, amp you up, right? And it can be a really good distraction. So if you don't feel like it, don't utilize it just yet. Because it's like a little like pocket rocket, you know? Yeah. So if you don't feel like it, don't use it yet. Right. Yeah. Save that Save for it. when you really need yeah. it. Yes. Because then it loses its power when you do it later. Yes, it so does. So I, I probably won't listen to music for hours. Yeah. Hours. Like why would you start there? No, I've got all my friends there. There's music on the Jeep maybe, like it's background music or something. That's um, why like even at the start, you don't want people geeing you up. No, just, let's all just have a talk. Let's just yeah. chat. They'll just pace it. They'll walk next to me. We'll just talk. And then 12, 15 hours in, maybe I'll chuck some tunes on. Okay. And then yeah. build up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then there'll be points where I'm like, you know, I've got the music on at 3 a.m. in the morning in a dark <laughs> hole where I'm, you know, having to get there. And then that's There's where- There's a time and place for it. But that's when you start to, to dig. Yeah. Into like the demons. Yeah. Where, where do you go? Oh, I haven't been there for a while. When's the last time you <laughs> went there? Is that the burpee stuff? Is that the ultra stuff? I think there was a little bit of that. And Sorry, maybe the last five marathon. minutes of the marathon. The, the last 10K of the marathon, I had to dig pretty deep. Marathon or um, triathlon? The, the, yeah, that one. Triathlon. Yeah, yeah, the full distance triathlon, but the marathon portion of that, the last 10, 20K, I was, you know. What were you feeling? I was pretty tired. Yeah. And I just... What type of tired? Is it just muscle? I, look, like- I actually use alter egos. So that's one thing I'm big on. Um, I don't know if you've heard much about alter egos. And I stuff, know the but concept, but what do you mean? So there's a book called The Alter Ego Effect. Great book. But okay. essentially, like, a, you ha- create this, like, different version of yourself in your own mind. Yeah. And you use that person to overcome hardship. So, like, exercise. So, like, um, for example, James Lawrence, the guy who did the triathlons, right? He has one called The Iron Cowboy. Okay. But it's, like, referring to yourself as a different self. So, like, mine, for some, I don't know how it got there, but it's now being called The Phlegm, which is my <laughs> Just like grown up, that's where I've kind of I've kind of built that up, and yeah. he's the type of guy that just can do hard shit, okay. and like he can dig deep. He yeah. doesn't get crushed. Yeah. So like, using like using that makes you feel a bit invincible, right? So I'm talking to Ethan Fleming now. You're talking to Ethan Fleming, but the Flem, who he comes out, <laughs> he will fuck you up. Yeah, and even my, it's become a bit of a thing with my friends. Like I, you know, they'll be like, "Can't wait to see the Flem come out on this." Right. Like it's just yeah, so it's become like an alter ego. How long have you had this for? <laughs> it's probably probably um, I don't know three or four years. I think it's a really useful tool. Interesting. I don't. It just works. It just works. I wonder. People have it for everything as well. For like for school. For well, so we have different faces, different masks for when well, we step into different environments, that's, right? That's, that's yeah. That's different alter ego, right? Yeah. You just give it a name. Yeah. And then you can step into it though. Yeah. If you give it a name, it's like you can become it. Quicker. Yeah. You can just chuck. It, just I can jump into that one when I need to. And when he comes out, I give it like an endorphin rush. Like it's yeah. actually like a bit of like DID. <laughs> DID? No, oh, like dis- dis- uh, disassociation disorder, I think. It's like split personality. Okay. So you yeah. disassociate from your actual like- Yeah, because my actual character. self is suffering. Yeah. But Flem, he's like- He doesn't. He doesn't suffer. He embraces that shit. <sighs> yeah. So then it's like- This is interesting. Yeah. That's where like second wind, I think it's alter ego. Like my alter ego brings out my second wind. That mm-hmm. I can create, I can physically, I, this is what's so crazy. Like I can go into my psychology to change my physiological state. Mm-hmm. So I can, I can actually, I feel like I'm so in tune with it that I can create my alter ego, bring out my alter ego and then get an endorphin rush. 
So like I can create my own endorphin rush. That's amazing. Which is pretty full on. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's practice. I don't know what that is. Like that's, that's practice from training, but I feel like I know how to create it. I think some people can get that from really powerful music. You get this, um, hyper secretion of, of noradrenaline, adrenaline, dopamine, mm. where it blunts pain. Mm. Yeah, mine comes out through alter ego. Yeah. Yeah, so like the phlegm. And even that that feeling there gives me a bit of Do you talk to yourself? All the time. Out loud or in your head? All the time out loud. Because I'll go out loud too. All the time, daily, every day, flat out. But it's not always hype. It's sometimes, it's, no, it's what just, is it? Man, I talk to myself all the time. Mm. Yeah, physically out loud. I feel like it's a bit of a meditation, a bit like a self-reflection check, check yourself. Yeah, Stay on the right path. Thinking. How often do we think? We don't think enough. Right. Because we're always preoccupied. Yeah. That might sound weird to people, right? But no, you're right. Yeah. Everything we do is in like a, just a repetitive state of reaction rather than thinking. And even communicating. Mm. When's the last time you sat down for two hours and talked someone eye to eye like this? Yeah. Which is nice. It is. Yeah. It's like probably you, the most socialized in like the last <laughs> year. <laughs> yeah. You'd be pulling Jeeps yeah. and lifting weights. Yeah. It's, um, we, we need to have time to ourselves because- we find ourselves when we're by ourselves. Um, we find ourselves when we're by ourselves. Yeah, I like things that sound nice because things that sound nice are glued Remember. to your brain, yeah. Put that on a T-shirt. Yeah, that's it. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So when's it, the last time you were in that dark place? And then um, you're talking to yourself. The phlegm is the type of guy that doesn't back down. Like That's kind of what I say to myself. Like, yeah. you know, it's 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 – you know, how do you want to be remembered? Like, what is it you, like, you know, you're not the type of person that quits, all those kind of thoughts. But I don't have to get, I feel like I don't need to get as dark during hard things anymore. You don't need to go to like childhood shit? Yeah, but I also haven't done something like this before, so let's find out. You know? Oh, we're going to find out. Yeah, You might exactly. do a podcast after this and yeah. then we'll see where you went. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I haven't, I might not have been there because I haven't taken myself there, but I'm sure I'm, I am sure I'm going to find it. Because there's no way I'm walking for 50, 60 k's with a car and not finding some type of a <laughs> craziness. You just said 50, 60. Yeah. Really? Well, no, because I know once I get to the 80, I'm going to find that 20. <laughs> but there's, it's that between that 50 and 70 that I'm worried about. You see, is that... Wait. Oh, I see. In the yeah. middle. Yeah. It's like I, you know, you've been I know I'm hitting 40, 50. I know it. Yeah. Like it's not even on my radar to yeah. not be a 40, 50. But in between? But something can happen after 50. To, it's, 50 it's always like, it's the same people say for the 100, 100K run yeah. or whatever it is. Like the first 50 is like 50, 60 is preparation. Between 60 and 80, 90 is when you have to dig. And do you think it's it's valuable then to, to do the countdown from like when you're getting close? Like from 80, 81, 82. I'm just, I don't want people, I have a few rules for the event. For the people that are helping. What, don't um, tell you certain things? Uh, yeah, I don't want to know anything. You don't want to know how long? I just want to be out there for a day. So you don't, you I just want to make sure I'm on pace. Just tell me if I'm on pace. That's it. So people just tell me when I'm on pace. Got it. Yeah. So you go, You need to go faster. Okay, thanks. You shouldn't slow down if you want to. All right, thanks. That's it. <laughs> okay. That's all I want to know. But then you're not overthinking. No one's allowed to frown as well. No one's allowed to frown. No one's allowed to frown. What's frown. frown look like? Sad. No one's allowed to complain. Okay. If you want to complain, go home. Yep. Gotcha. You don't have to be there. I appreciate you being there, but you don't have to be there. Um, because negativity is an infection, yeah. Especially in events like that, you can't have that. Yeah. So if I, I, it's only good vibes only, <laughs> <laughs> legitimately. Yeah. No, because all it, like one seed of doubt, yeah, or negativity. Who knows the course I could put your mind for sure? Look, I think anyone is com- uh, uh, capable of accomplishing something crazy if you break it down and don't overcomplicate it as well. So, you know, the car, right? Can you push a car hundred one k? Yeah, probably. So you could push a car 1K. So you could push a car 100K. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take you to get there. It's like everyone, I personally think everyone is, can, maybe, yeah, certain circumstances, no, but 99% of the population can go to a marathon tomorrow. It just has, they just have to do it. <laughs> There's no one wants to do it. Like I, when I did my first marathon, I was literally not, I was fit, but I wasn't running or doing any cardio at all. I just went and did it. What were you like after that? Yeah, I was in pain. Or even during like, it. I don't think it's smart necessarily. No, but you just know, like, it's impossible. It's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's like, so for me, I just see, I see the hundred Ks as like one K a hundred times. Ah, so before yeah. you do the event, you're thinking like that, but during the event. I'm just doing. You're not thinking about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see now. Yeah. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of like, a, it's a whole different mind game, but okay. you know, big goals can be broken down and they're just tiny little goals done on repeat. So I know for a fact that I can hit five, I hit 5k the other day. It took me an hour and a half and I felt good. Cool. So I know I could probably hit 20, 30 before I feel shit. Yeah. 
So I can hit 20 to 30 Ks before I feel shit. So 100 should be possible. Did you ever think about doing 20, 30 Ks in your prep? Um, yeah, I did. The Honestly, the only thing that's kind of stopped me with that has been COVID. Because like I, you can't, it's pretty hard to go drag a car anywhere. And you can't, the, recently, oh. recently it's been okay. But now I don't want to go do a five, six hour stint and ruin myself before the event either. Because yeah, it's too close. Yeah. So like I live in St. Kilda. We've had travel limits on. Yeah. So it's all highly populated. And there's been a curfew time, which I didn't like. Didn't want to really go break. Mm. Um, so, like, if you can't really drag a car during the day, because it's cars. <laughs> and for those who don't know, where have you been pulling it? Yeah, I've been pulling it in like Bunnings car park and <laughs> things right. like that. Yeah. So, right. like, people, car parks is like the only thing, and every big car park has been populated, and so it's been difficult. But I feel I feel that the sled has been the most perfect mimic movement i could do yeah because it's harder yeah which is good and it's very portable mm. easily can do it anywhere that's it yeah what's to kind of close out the conversation mm. what's what's one of the hardest things what is the hardest thing you've ever done in your life oh, physically um would probably be the burpees the 24 hours of burpees was pretty hard. It was, yeah. I haven't done anything harder than that. What, okay. What was the point in that where that tested you the most? I think maybe like 16 hours in when yeah. it was just me and a few people. I already did kind of what I wanted to do and I was already like going to break the record. So I was a bit like mentally tapped out. And then you went another. Eight hours. Eight hours? No, more. Yeah, I think we broke eight the record hours. maybe at like 17, 18 hours or something. Well, the theoretical record. Um, but then after that, I just didn't want to be there anymore. But you did. Yeah, but I feel like I had a lot more. I feel like I was a lot more mentally weak back then. Okay. Back then, it was a lot of like resistance. I, I had to force myself. It was a lot of like talk. It was a lot of like, mm. you know, you had to. I had to always remind myself stuff. Oh, now you I weren't in a zone then. That wasn't meditation. That wasn't. No, I feel like that back then I was just I was like I didn't want to give up. That's kind of my mentality. That was my mentality then. Mm. Where now I feel like I don't even the, the conversation's not there. Huh. You know what I mean? Like I'm not having that conversation. It's not even on the on the table. No, it's not on the radar. I just I just do it. <laughs> it's less. It's like, you know. Same thing for that triathlon. Like that was 15 hours on the grind, mm. which, you know, heaps of people do triathlons. Mm. But for me at the time, that was pretty intense with no training and stuff. But like I didn't even think about it during it. I just did it. So I don't know. I feel like I've got to a point through the years of repetition now where I think less, which helps. Do you, man, that sounds like an antidote to a lot of people's problems. Mm. Like it Nike is. was onto something. <laughs> yeah, just do it, literally. Like such a simple phrase. Yeah, just do it. Don't think about it. Like, cool. Just go. Mm. What about emotionally? What, the hardest thing? Yeah. Oh, God. Have you faced any deaths or... No, nah, not really. No, I haven't really faced... I've actually been pretty lucky there. I've not lost anyone. Yet? Um, yeah, yet. I don't... I, I said that respectfully. I don't have a lot of people close to me that are not friends and young. So I'm pretty, like... I have like my work friends, a couple of work friends. Yeah, I keep to myself. You keep you keep a tight circle. Yeah, I keep a very 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 tight circle. You know, I don't even see my family that much. So then, emotionally, do you feel like? I mean, that's a protective mechanism. Yeah, isn't that's it? what you learned. Yeah, so that's something you, you said you're working well, on. So then, that's probably the hardest emotional thing that I have to deal with is trying to overcome all those. Right, man. But you but you can't like that's that's not a race. No, that's time. You can't work that. You can work it, but you can't. You can't just. Well, you can't it muscle instantly. it. No, no, you, you know? can't muscle it. You gotta, you gotta be with it for a yeah. while. That's what I like is that. He, I think it humanizes you, mm. which I, I think is valuable because people put people like you on a pedestal, and um, they feel like you're almost like a inhuman. Mm. But you have very similar struggles to a lot of people. Mm. Everyone does. <sighs> You took your real father hasn't been in your life. Your mother's been a sole source of leadership and, and a parental figure in your life. But as you've grown up into the man you are, what mm. do you think it is that defines and already is to be a man? Well, I think it's probably the things that I struggle with the most. Some of it is just vulnerability. I think that we put 
like the whole stereotype of men not being vulnerable is an issue. Yeah. So I think that then that's probably what to be a man or to be a good human, not even like is to be vulnerable mm. and to be open and transparent. So I'm definitely transparent. I got that one. Mm. I'll tell you, dickhead, if you're a dickhead. Um, but I think it to be open and to be vulnerable is what makes someone strong. Okay. Yeah. Ethan Fleming. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming on, man, and sharing and being vulnerable, <laughs> yeah, Sh- and sharing your uh, your heart and mind. Um, where <sighs> what I wanted to do also by having you on is is hopefully give a small platform to help raise more money, get more awareness towards this cause that you also care about. Where would you send people if they want to support this this endeavor? Yeah, so you can find all of the donation uh, details through typing in the world's strongest ultra or you got that key tag the I'm Google pretty t- sure that's sweet I'm, from, I'm pretty sure from memory it comes up with the donation page sweet if not you can find it through me on instagram which is ethan j fleming and Thank it's you. in there links below ethan is there anything you want to finish with any closing thoughts any any last things that you wanted to mention before we finish about what you're experiencing anticipating <laughs> i don't know i feel like we just nailed it just before just do it think less <laughs> That's yeah. probably the biggest thing that's helped me accomplish things that I didn't think possible is because I didn't think about them. I just went and did them. What do you think the future Ethan would tell this Ethan 20 years, 30 years from now? Maybe think more. No, I don't know. It's, um, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, it's no. a hard question. But you have to really think about that. Yeah. No, I think enjoy it. Just keep enjoying it. Keep striving. Keep doing what I'm doing. Honestly, I feel like I'm on a good path with constant ups and downs. And I'm just riding them and keep going. Stay on the path. That's it. Done. Thank you, Ethan. Cheers, man. Appreciate it.